All right, we'll call the Environment, Legacy, and Climate Committee to order. Let the record show that uh, the time is now 3.08 on Thursday, February 22nd, 2024. So we have a lot, a lot on our agenda today. And so just want to make an announcement beforehand that as we move on further to the bills that have more testifiers, we want to limit testimony to two minutes. So I will start with two of my bills first, and I will be setting an example, keep it under one minute of my time, and want to make sure that my testifier will keep it short as well. So we now do have a, a quorum. And I will pass the gavel to Senator Housechow, who will be chair while I'm presenting my bill. So. All right, thank you everybody. Um, I bet you didn't expect to see me chairing the Environment Committee, so excited to be here. Uh, we have Senator Hers, Senate File 3394. Oh, I'm, excuse me, 3393, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senate File 3393 is a bill that protects our public health and the environment by helping to ensure that critical public funding be available when needed to mitigate the risk posed by our closed landfill across the state. The Closed Landfill Invest Fund, or CLIF and MLCAT, were established by the legislature in, 19, in, the legislature in 1999 with the intent to earn interest and readily be available in later years to pay for future environment response on closed landfill starting July 1st, 2020. Senate 53393 would require that impacted communities have a say in whether uh, money is taken out of this landfill trust account to be used for the purpose other than what is cited in the statute. The requirements include a review and comment period in the counties likely to have greatest negative impacts and the approval by the county boards before funds can be directed. With me to present the bill or testify on the bill is Mr. Matt Massman from Minnesota Intern County Association. Thank you, Senator Herr. Mr. Massman. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. Matt Mossman, Executive Director of the Minnesota Inter-County Association. MICA represents 15 of Minnesota's larger and faster growing counties in the state, although, as Representative Herr noted, uh, this really impacts uh, closed landfills all over the state. As Chair Herr noted in his opening statement, this is really a bill that would go a long way towards ensuring the corpus of landfill trust funds remains in place. Uh, and is only redirected after getting input from the communities uh, and county governments that are most at risk for public health and environmental risks and arguably the economic consequences that could flow as a result of those uh, conditions um, when uh, funds are taken from the corpus. Um, once a landfill closes, it must be monitored and maintained for decades to ensure that it does not ne negatively impact people or the environment. The long-term care of landfills can be costly and includes both regular costs for monitoring and maintenance and potentially episodically, episodic costs that are much larger for remediation or repair if needed. Just an, as, as an example, the, the Metropolitan Landfill Contingency Acts and Trust I think is estimated to have about $65 million in expected costs through 2039, I believe it is, and hundreds of millions of dollars, over $300 million of estimated costs likely to be needed for the closed landfill site of roughly 110 million closed landfills across the state. Just to give one example, Dakota County 
has uh, three closed landfills in the program, one of which is largest by acreage, the freeway uh, landfill and dump. But these closed landfills are in St. Louis County, in Ramsey County, all over the state, and oftentimes uh, are, the funds are also funded by local contributions. The Millcat, for example, is at least partially funded by a portion of a metropolitan uh, solid waste service fee, a portion of which gets deposited into the Millcat. So this simply would say there are statutory reasons for which these funds have been uh, put in place, uh, and if the money is going to be redirected out of those funds for any other purpose, that the local units of government, um, the counties and the communities that are most likely to be impacted if those resources would not be available when they're needed, would have an opportunity to have input into that uh, decision. So we support the bill. Uh, we thank uh, uh, Chair Her for bringing it forward and happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Massman. Any questions from the members? <clears throat> Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the uh, author of the bill. It's just a small question because I didn't see it in here. Um, is there, you know, you talk about the most need, and uh, is there anything in here that would uh, give a split between the metro and, uh, and greater Minnesota, or is it it's just down the list? Uh, if, you, if you see where I'm coming from, you guys have bigger landfills, but ours are just, just as important, and I want to know if there's anything that uh, would divert some of this over to the greater Minnesota landfills. Uh, uh, Mr. Massman. Mr. Chair and Senator, I, I actually haven't looked up what the 10 largest are by acreage, but I assume that they are in various places around the state. Certainly, uh, there would be several of them that would be in the metro area, but I think some of them would be in the exurban area as well as other places uh, in Minnesota also. Okay, any other questions from members? Okay, any further discussion? We'll move on. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to testify for or against this bill? All right, seeing none, Senator Herr, any closing comments on the bill? Uh, thank you very much. This is just to put the uh, uh, guidelines so that uh, citizens have more participation and, and money that we already have in place. Uh, so this bill, as in short, our summary, uh, is mainly requires a public review period and the county approval before funds can be transferred under MLCAT uh, and, and can be directed. So I ask members to support this bill. Thank you. Okay. Does a member want to move and recommend that this bill be sent to the Senate floor? Senator, Senator McEwen uh, so moves. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. All right, the motion prevails. We'll now move on to Senate file 3631. Senator Herr. Chair House Child and members, Senate File 3631 is a 2024 DNR policy and technical bill. Each year, the DNR proposes policy related and technical changes to Minnesota statute that deals with multiple programs administered by the agency. This year's proposal change will help the DNR manage the state's natural resource adaptively and respond to public input. The 2024 policy and technical bills focuses on changes related to sustainable forest man management, ecosystem management, and improving DNR business and policy practices. Uh, Chair and member, I'd like uh, to hand over to uh, the testimony of my testifier here, uh, Mr. John Waters uh, commi from Commissioner's Office of the DNR. So. Great. Welcome, Mr. Waters. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. Again, my name is John Waters. I'm Government Relations Unit Supervisor at the DNR. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today to present the agency's policy technical bill. Mr. Waters, could you just uh, speak into the microphone just a little bit more? Thanks so much. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, so I'll briefly run through the bill. Uh, section one, uh, this change would allow the State Board of Investment to manage financial assurance funds for mining projects on behalf of the DNR, reducing costs and expediting access to funds if needed. Uh, section two uh, provides a process for the DNR to deposit net income into the permanent school fund and certified costs to be transferred to the forest management investment account by June 30th each year. Section three. Uh, this change would allow the agency to request the Department of Administration to allow for the sale, donation, or conveyance of bison to a government or nonprofit organization within or outside of the state of Minnesota um, when it would be in the benefit of the state's natural resources or bison management. Sections four and five, uh, these are proposed changes to prohibit the release of endangered or threatened species and clarify permitting requirements for imported endangered and threatened species. It would also explicitly include threatened species along with endangered species and its statutory protections aligning with current uh, regulatory requirements. Section six uh, would allow our uh, relief grant programs to provide grants and technical assistance to support new and emerging emer urban and community wood er utilization efforts, reducing wood waste. Section seven and eight, um, of this proposal contains three initiatives that allow the DNR to manage Minnesota's forests sustainably today and in the future more effectively and efficiently. Um, it removes the seedling production cap and allows the DNR state forest nursery to grow and sell both bare root and, sub and plug seedlings. Uh, and then section nine uh, extends the minerals coordinating committee um, charged with research and planning for diversified mineral development in the state from 2026 to 2036. Sections 10, 11, 12, and 13 provide clarity on how to define malicious intent when enforcing a provision that doubles fines from, for animals killed with malicious intent. This was passed last session. In section 14, uh, this change would correct an unintended fee change passed during the 2023 legislative session by creating a separate application fee for water use general permits that should not have been subject to the 2023 fee increases. Uh, this concludes my comments on the bill. Thank you for the opportunity to present before you today. I'm available to stand for questions and we also have additional staff here as well. Thank you, Mr. Waters. Any questions from members? Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, question to the testifier. Um, I've dealt with some of this stuff in the past in the House, and uh, so I'm just wondering, you're removing a cap uh, for, on the seedlings, and can you tell me why the cap was put there in the first place? Uh, thank you for the question. I would have to defer. I do not know the history of that. Mr. Bob Meyer is going to come up and help. Mr. Mara, please state your full name and title and answer the question. Thank Thanks. you, Mr. Chairman. Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. Senator Green, thank you for the question. The language revolved surrounding the nurseries has been quite old. You can see the, the dates on there. Uh, the, the cap was built at a time when there was other growers in the state that were trying to do this. Right now, there's no other producers in the state that are producing the, the quality and the quantity of seedlings we need for our reforestation activities. And we're buying a lot of our materials from Canada right now, our, our root stock or our bald stock, containerized stock. And there's a lot of competition out there. We need as many trees as we can possibly get for our reforestation activities. That's why we need to move our forest, our nursery into production more, uh, increase the production in our nursery. Okay. Senator Green. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that, uh, Commissioner Myers. Um, I, I didn't know that. I just kind of wanted to get on the record and then state that, for the record, uh, there used to be uh, people or businesses in and around the area that did provide those seedlings, and they were kind of put out of business by the state. Uh, and so um, we kind of made our own bed there now. Uh, but I will be interested in looking and seeing how this develops and be interested in looking at your, the progress of, uh, of this and, and how it's done. And, uh, and as long as I've got the floor, uh, I think we were talking about this earlier, and you said you're going to be buying plugs now and then planting, or are you going to grow them in plugs? Mr. Meyer. Mr. Chairman, currently we are acquiring, when we can and when it's desired, plug seedlings from uh, a grower in Canada. 
most of our other, the production at the facility right now is a bare root facility, which in times of low moisture, which we've received this year and previous years, um, we did have seedling mortality for our reforestation activity. So going to a more durable, more durable, uh, more sustainable planting material is our desire. And the plan is to move to a containerized production facility, the plugs that, that you're talking about. Thank That's you, Mr. Chair. That was my question. Are you going to be growing them in the plugs yourself? Or is the state going to be doing that now? Mr. Meyer. Mr. Chairman, Senator Green, we received funding last year in the bonding bill to begin that work. It's going to take several years to get the nursery into production, but that's the intention, yes. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Senator Wiesenberg. <coughs> thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this question or not. Probably anybody, Bob or yourself. Um, so as you were talking about planting seedlings, I hunt up in the Chippewa National Forest and we're doing, well, it's a national forest, so I don't know if you have anything to do with it. That's why I say I don't know if you can answer the question, but um, you know, where they're doing selective harvest and they're planting these seedlings, those pine trees aren't growing. So I don't know where we, I would say, I, I know we want to reforest the forest that we took out, but when we're doing selective harvest and we still have a large canopy of oak trees, there's been pine trees where I hunt that are this big and they've been that big for 10 years. So uh, do we have a better management practice to maybe get those trees in a more open area so we can better utilize that resource? Mr. Mr. Mar Chairman, Senator Wiesenberger, or Wiesenberger I, I will touch on this and we can circle back with you individually. Our, we do site preparation. We make sure where our reforestation activities are appropriate. We're using site-specific species, for example, wherever we can, trying to be prepared for different impacts in the climate, right? And some of those seedlings you're talking about may be understory that were naturally regenerating. I don't know if they were planted or not, but uh, we do the best we can to make sure our, our forestry reforestation work are adaptive and we're planting the right species in the right sites. Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it just, it just popped in my head, so I thought I'd talk about it. So thank you. All right. Any other questions from members? Is there anyone in the audience that would like to testify for or against? <coughs> Senator Hurt, any closing comments? Thank you, uh, Chair Hauchow. Uh, again, this is a technical change bill, and uh, it will help the agency to operate more efficiently and in, engage with uh, the stakeholders. And uh, Mr. Mr. Water already mentioned and covered it all. Uh, just to remind folks, you know, you probably have a, a little sheet here, you know, if you want to look in more detail, uh, the, the sheet here will provide thorough information of section to section. So thank you very much and hope for your support to pass this uh, policy technical change bill. Okay, thank you, Senator Herr. And with that, Senate file 3631 will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus. Okay, thank you. No, it's mine. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Hauschild, for keeping our hearing here on track with time. And next. On our agenda is Senator Hoffman, Senator File 3400. Senator Hoffman, welcome. Mr. Chair and, and members, thank you. Of, of, of all the bills that I do in the Minnesota Senate, I got to tell you, it's every once in a while you do one that is absolutely brings joy and, and smiles on me on this one. This is one of them, and this is my re-election bill. I'm kidding. Just kidding. That's just, all right, that's supposed to be funny. I'm sorry I'm not funny, but uh, I want to thank uh, you and, and Senator Eichhorn uh, for signing on and Senator McEwen uh, as co-authors. But Bill, this bill, what it does, Mr. Chair and members, is it temporarily allows a person to use a digital image 
of their game and fish license as proof of possession uh, of the license. And that this provision would be in effect until March 1st, 2026. That's the date, Mr. Chair, when the DNR is required to offer that paperless licensing option as a result of our 2023 legislative actions. Um, what I have in front of you, though, is the uh, A1 amendment, if you'd please uh, hand that out. Okay, the A1 amendment is ahead of us, uh, it's in front of us. Um, Sarah McCune moves the amendment, uh, the, the amendment A1 uh, to Senate file 3400. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, opposed, nay. Motion prevail. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And, and with that, that A1, what we did is, is instead of waiting till July 1, 2024 to enact it, because remember, this is kind of that gap area between now and when it gets into effect in 2026, is that we're saying it is the day following a final enactment. And I just want to let you know that, that there's lots of people that um, want to see this permit happen. And I know one, I talked to the Deer Hunters Association, and that's a you know, pretty small association in the state of Minnesota. No, it's not. It's a large association in Minnesota, and they really stand uh, in support of this digital imaging bill. And, and with me is, um, is our wonderful Lieutenant Colonel from the DNR uh, to talk about what's next. So, Welcome, Colonel, and please state your name for the record. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Robert Grecki, Assistant Director for the DNR Enforcement Division. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, the DNR supports the intent of this legislative uh, legislation. Uh, under current Minnesota law, if a person purchases a paper license, such as at a gas station or a bait store, uh, they are required to carry that as proof of license. This is inconsistent with people that purchase their licenses currently online, where an electronic copy of that license is sufficient for proof of licensure. What this law will do will uh, act as a stopgap until the DNR's completely new electronic licensing system does come into effect in 2025. The DNR also will be coming forward with a comprehensive uh, regulation package for uh, consideration to address all of these issues as well as this one. Uh, and with that, I uh, uh, stand for questions. Okay, any question from members to Senator Hoffman or to uh, Colonel uh, Gorski? Okay, uh, look like it's a ready to go legislation. So, uh, any testify from the audience? Okay, Sarah Hoffman, any? Hey, Mr. Comment? Chair, and I'm, I'm wondering since this is such, there's a, there's a, you know, an, kind of an immediate need. It's not controversial, and really looks at what what Lieutenant um, Gorecki was, Lieutenant Colonel Gorecki was talking about. You know, it's kind of that sap gap between now and in 2026. I'm wondering, you know, you, we have it in here to be laid over, but since it's by itself um, non-controversial, would it, would it be authorized to be able to go to the floor or could we dual track it? Um, and I don't know what the, what the will of the group here is or what the will of the other body, not that we would care about the other body, but, you know, that's... Um. Senator Hoffman, uh, with advice from the council, I think we can go, go, go ahead with the dual track. track. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So with that, I, I, I make a motion then that Senate file 3400 be passed and put on general orders. Is that As correct? Amended. As amended. As amended. Thank you. So all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay. Motion prevail. Mr. Chair and members, thank you. And thank you, Lieutenant Colonel. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Okay, next on our agenda here is Senator Kunish bill, uh, Senate File 3730, uh, Native Perry Protection Opportunity Expansion. S Senator Kunish, I'm aware you have an A1 amendment, author amendment as well. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. The A1 amendment um, is a simple amendment that changes uh, from must pay to may pay up to uh, in case there are individuals who would like to actually donate their native prairie lands to the state rather than the state having to uh, pay them 
it gives them the de, um, the, script, the uh, choice of, of accepting that um, that gift or paying up to the amount that it, that was um, decided. Okay, Senator Kunish, would you move the A1 amendment to Senate File 3731? 3730. 30, 3730. 30, 3730. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so Senator McCune uh, moves that the A1 am amendment uh, to the Senate File 3730 be adopted. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay, uh, opposed, same sign. Okay, uh, motion prevail. And to the bill, Senator Kunish. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. So um, what this bill does, it aims to change the definition of uh, from land that has never been plowed with less than 10% tree cover, predominantly native vege prairie vegetation, to a grassland dominated by original native prairie vegetation, usually occurring where sod has never been broke. So it's um, updating the, uh, the definition so that it aligns with current science on the prairies. Um, this bill is uh, focusing on native prairie band easements, and those are voluntary agreement between a landowner and Minnesota Department of Natural Resources where the landowner agrees to manage the land under an easement in ways that protect the native prairie in, ex in exchange for an upfront one-time payment. Um, we know that the Minnesota easements payment rates are lower than other states and federal rates, which discourages landowners from enrolling in the program. So increasing payments will ensure that the rates are proportionate to the higher level of protection that is offered by this program. This bill also adds prairies. Um, prairies can be gained through school trust lands via the land administrator. Right now, roughly 5% of Minnesota's remaining unprotected native prairie occurs on school trust lands, which means that prairie easements can't be uh, placed there. So by allowing those easements on school trust lands, the state will provide an opportunity to protect and manage those resources and, as a bonus, provides additional revenue source for the permanent school funds. And those permanent school funds are dollars that go to student, uh, to our educational system. Every student in Minnesota um, basically is a trust baby, as they say. And so that will add to the, um, the fund for um, education. And so um, I think it's really important that we are looking for ways to provide important habitats for our native plants and animals, like some of the uh, um, owls, voles, badgers, and snakes. Um, I know snakes are not really most people's favorite, but I know I collected plenty of gardener snakes as a kid. Um, it provides water filtration. Fil filtration and storage, and that increases um, the health of our watersheds, uh, and it creates really rich and healthy soil. It's absolutely important that we are uh, working hard to and intentionally to protect our prairies. Prairies are recognized as one of the most threatened ecosystems in North America, and temperate grasslands uh, are one of the most threatened in the world. Right now, Minnesota um, only has 1% to 2% of its original native prairie, which is a very sad statistic to have. 41% uh, of our state's rare species are found in these native prairies, even though native prairie only covers 0.5% of the land area. And nearly half of Minnesota's native prairies remain unprotected, with a vast majority occurring on privately owned land. Uh, we know that our prairies are incredibly low maintenance and they're very water efficient. And so I would ask for your support in, of this bill. And um, we do have a testifier here. Thank you. And please inter uh, introduce yourself for the record. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members. Uh, thanks for allowing me to come and testify on behalf of this proposal. My name is Judy Elbert. I am the Scientific and Natural Areas Unit Supervisor for the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, I've spent the last 13 years specializing in native prairie protection and management throughout the state. 
and I am the statewide lead for the Native Prairie Bank easement program. Uh, and what we're asking for here is changes to help us deliver our program better to the landowners that we work with. Um, and she, as Senator uh, Kunish um, explained, it's you know increasing our payment rates so that we are proportionate to what we are asking of the landowners to the rights and the management that we are asking them to do to keep these high quality prairies high quality. Uh, it's a a lot more management than you would have to do on a low quality prairie to keep high quality prairies high. Uh, we are asking to update the definition to meet the current DNR uh, definition for native prairies and we're asking to be able to do easements on school trust lands as noted. Um, I just really want to you know make that final note of the fact that currently 53 percent of our native prairies in Minnesota are not protected. So 53% of roughly 250,000 acres, that's not protected. Uh, that's about 126,000 acres that house 41%, well, the whole 250 houses 41% of our rare species in the state. So this isn't, I, I don't really look at this as a real estate proposal. This is protecting our state's biodiversity and giving the landowners the best tools we can to protect that biodiversity. So. With that, I will stand for any questions that you have. Thank okay. you. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, for either the author or the testifier, um, you mentioned school trust lands, and you, you talked about how the fact that you're going to do easements on school trust lands, and that's going to help the school trust. These, as I understand it, are one-time payments, and uh, school trust lands, are, are crucial for us. They, they're a big, uh, big help to our schools. And land values continue to increase. And we like to make money off of our land to support the schools. So how is a one-time payment going to be better for the school trust than having this land uh, being used and utilized in, a, in an ongoing manner? Ms. Albert, uh, Senator Kunish. Uh, yeah, Chair and members, so there's about 7,025 acres of native prairie on school trust lands. Some of that has aggregate value, right? Where it might not make sense to put it in a native prairie bank easement. It, it, we might be looking and exploring other options, right? But some of this land that's native prairie really has no other use. There's no other value for it. This might be the highest and best value is to protect the native prairie and manage it for native prairie. The perk of doing an easement over potentially like a condemnation fee title, buying it completely out, is that you, the school trust can actually still retain some rights. And so we don't know what carbon credits is going to do the, down the road. We don't know what other, some of these other potential options are. And these easement terms can be worked through to kind of keep open some of those other options down the road versus maybe just completely buying out the whole school trust. Um, right away. And so it's it's a tool in the toolbox. I'm not saying it'll be the perfect fit for all 7,025 acres, but for some of that really wet prairie or prairie that has federally endangered species that you would have to do so much mitigation on that you really can't do anything else, um, it might be our best and highest use of those school trust lands. Senator Green, any follow-up? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's kind of contradicting what you said because if you're putting the easement on, you're actually limiting the use of the land. And I don't see anything in here that actually says you're going to be able to, uh, or who's going to do the determination on what school trust gets easements, what does not. So that would be something that I would continue to look at. But I also want to talk about the fact that uh, the amount of money that's being paid here. Can you explain to me why in this bill it says for... Uh, and this is on uh, page two, line 27. For acquisition under this paragraph, the commissioner may pay up to 25% more than what the Board of Water and Soil Resources pays for non-crop easements. So we're increasing the, the, the amount of, of uh, payments by a considerable amount. And why is that? Ms. Albert. Yeah, chair and members. So the 25% the is for if something were to qualify for Native Prairie Bank, which means it has to be the top quality Native Prairie that's out there to even qualify for our program. We're talking for a slim amount of acres, like 0.2% at most of state lands, of 
Minnesota lands, like under the 126,000. I'm likely, you know, this is speculation, but we've protected 16,000 acres since 1987 when Prairie Bank was established. So even if we could double that, that's only 16,000 acres, right? We're talking a really small amount of land that qualifies for this, for this program. So if you take that and um, you say, well, that's housing some of like the bulk of our biodiversity of the state, the bulk of our rare species. And we're gonna say, we're gonna pay more for it because this is a really high ask. These landowners have to put an easement on their land and then we help them manage it long-term to maintain this quality. Um, so we pay a certain level. The 25% is to say, like we don't wanna discourage people from selling fee title to the state because they could potentially get more for an easement. So this is just kind of like, language that just makes sure that there wouldn't ever be a conflict between those two things. And we're saying that we're only gonna do this for this really top tier, high quality native prairie because it's worth it for the biodiversity of the state. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Green. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, first thing I would say is the 16,000 acres is not a little amount, it's a lot of land. Uh, and. Uh, I have a lot more questions, but I know we're gonna have a long night here, but the one thing that I'm just gonna have to say, you know, you, you talk about this land like uh, you're changing the definition from, uh, from not being able to be disturbed until could be disturbed. You might be able to, you know, we might be able to go after disturbed land. This land isn't sitting there and being destroyed. This is the farmland. And Minnesota is a diverse state. It's one of the reasons that we can uh, do better in, in rough times, because we have so many different uh, uh, ways to uh, keep our state going. And farming, the last time I checked, was about 30% of our GDP. And so when you, when you talk like this and you're starting to buy up native prairie, this is, this is all of our farmland along southern Minnesota and up through the valley. And so I'd be very cautious. I don't, I don't really care for this bill. Um, I think that... Uh, I think we're just opening up more to uh, taking more farmland out of production, and that's family farms. It's not, it's not corporate farms, it's family farms, and it keeps our local co our economy and our schools and our communities going. Thank you. Uh, Senator Kunish, uh, Ms. Elbert, want to respond to that? Or um, I think I think he, uh, he just pretty much make, make a remark, so no. Yeah, I would just say that I'm a fourth generation farmer. I live on my family's farm. So I understand what you were saying, but most of this native prairie, like the majority of it wasn't farmed for a reason. Thank you. Any, um, any further discussion on uh, Senate 53730? Yes. Oh, Senator McHugh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you so much, Senator Kunish, for bringing this bill and for um, your testimony as well today about the importance of this program. And um, I, I appreciate it so much hearing about preserving this diversity within our state. And it's, so, it's been so often when I've traveled around our state that I have seen just how much farmland there is. And we know that we have a lot of farmland in Minnesota, a lot of woods, um, but really wanting to see and experience experience our prairies as they were. And it, um, the fact that we have such, so little of that uh, native prairie left, I'm so thankful that we have a program like this that is trying to make sure that we keep that diversity and that we really have a, a program that is going to foster that. So thank you very much. I really appreciate this. Thank you. Any question from members? Any? Um, testimony from the audience, whether it's for or against. Okay, we're good. Um, so, Senator Kunish, any closing rem remark? Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I, I think this is an important, um, an important bill or important next step in protecting these very rare and these very precious uh, pieces and parcels of land. And, and as I stated in, uh, in my introduction as well as um, in the bill, uh, the native prairie, the definition are grasslands 
that are still dominated by the original native prairie vegetation. And that usually happens where the sod has never been broken. So this is, this is land that has never been farmed. It has never been plowed. It has never been disturbed. And probably carries, you know, well, thousands of years of, of um, vegetative and um, habitat that, that we have lost um, over the years. And so it's really important that we continue to find these unique par patches and parcels of land and that we do the best that we can to protect them. And so I would ask you all to support this bill. Thank you. And uh, Sarah McHugh, uh, can you move this? Okay. Uh, Sarah McHugh moved that Senate file 3730 as amended be recommended to pass and sent to the Senate floor. All in favor? Uh, so All moved, in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? No. Nay. Okay. Motion prevail. Thank you, Senator Kunish and uh, Ms. Elbert. Next is also Senator Kunish bill, um, Senate file 3558. 3558. And again, I'm going to reiterate uh, the amount of time limit for testifiers. Um, as I said earlier, I did set an example of keeping it short. So um, now it's your turn, uh, member of the audience or testifiers. And they are folks that are online ready to testify as well. So be ready as we call on you. And so Senator Kunish, to your bill. Thank you again. Um, um uh, Mr. Chair. So the bill I have before you is Senate File 3358, and uh, this bill is aiming to pro protect and ensure that Minnesota's public water protections extend to all waters that meet the statutory definition of a public water. Minnesota statute defines a public water in section 103G.005, and it provides a list and a map of public waters called the Public Water Inventory, or PWI, and that was created in the 1980s to in an attempt to document public waters in Minnesota. However, there are waters that meet the definition of public waters that are not currently listed on the PWI. And some of these waters are incorrectly deleted from the PWI back in 2017 when 640 stream miles across 71 counties were removed from the PWI by the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Some of the others were omitted from the PWI when it was created because of a lack of technology or simply because of oversight in the process of creating this inventory. So with the technology um, of 2024, any engineer with a GIS software can quickly determine if a waterway meets those definitions of public water. The technology has allowed us to, to really build that, uh, that definition and um, acknowledge those, those waters. This bill is, uh, will ensure that activities that impact public waters, such as agriculture drainage, they'll have to apply for the necessary permits and mitigate damage to the resource. And it has an important step to protect our public water resource uh, statewide. In September of 2022, the Minnesota Supreme Court ruled that it is the duty of the legislature to clarify the relationship between the inventory and the statutory definition of public waters. And this bill is doing just that. It clarifies that it is the statutory de definition of public waters that governs regardless of whether a water body, water body has correctly been identified on the PWI or not. And lastly, the PWI is an important tool for all stakeholders, and nothing in this bill diminish diminishes that. While this bill addresses the definition of a public waters and provides certainty on the front, it is also important for the PWI to be as accurate as possible. Uh, and with that, um, Mr. Chair, I do have a number of uh, testifiers who would like to speak in favor of Senate File 3385. Okay, thank you, Senator Quinnish. Um, may the testifier come forth. Uh, these will be uh, in person. Um, 
uh, I'd like to call Ms. Carly Griffin from Minnesota Center for Environmental Agency. Okay. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. I will do my best to keep within time. And uh, please, uh, please state your name for the record. Yes, um, Chair and members, my name is Carly Griffith. I am the Water Program Director at the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy. And I am here to testify in support of Senate File 3558. This bill clarifies the relationship between the statutory definition of public waters in 103G005 and the list and map called the Public Waters Inventory. What this bill does is it affirms that it is the statutory definition that defines the scope of the state's jurisdiction over public waters. This is an issue that is important to Minnesotans. When Minnesota became a state, its waters were transferred to the state government to be held in trust for its citizens. And in Minnesota, where water is central to our identity, the legislature has taken an expansive view of what counts as a public water. That expansive view is expressed in the statutory definition. The inventory, which was done in the early 1980s, is not 100% accurate and it does erroneously leave off some waters that meet the statutory definition. One example led to a lawsuit that did land in Minnesota Supreme Court, and in that September 2022 decision, the court agreed that for Limbo Creek in Renville County, the statutory definition should control. Uh, the court also noted that the legislature should clarify its intent. That's what this bill does. Where there are discrepancies between the inventory and the statutory definition, this bill eliminates confusion and provides clarity. It makes sense to bring this clarity to the law, especially today, where new technologies like LIDAR allow us to quickly identify whether any given water body meets the statutory definition. Further, some state laws, like the buffer law, explicitly refer to public waters that are listed on the inventory. This bill does not change that, and therefore does not lead to regulatory uncertainty under the buffer law. Finally, MCEA supports efforts to make the inventory as accurate as possible. The inventory should continue to be updated so that it can be a useful tool for all stakeholders. However, that has proven to be a slow process and Renville County sued to block additions to the inventory and to challenge the DNR's authority to add public waters to it. That lawsuit has since been dismissed. The DNR has previously stated that waters that meet the statutory definition do remain subject to all applicable public water regulations, regardless of whether they are included in the inventory. This bill formalizes that policy. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Let's go through the testimony first, and then we'll follow up with questions if any member has them. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to call on uh, Mr. Lenzuski from Trout Unlimited. So welcome, and please state your name for the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair members. My name is John Lencheski. I'm with Minnesota Trout Unlimited, and uh, thank you for the op opportunity to testify in person. I want to thank Senator Kunish for the bill. Um, this is important. This will protect um, more public waters that currently through past error are uh, potentially left unprotected. So um, I submitted some written comments. I'm not going to repeat those. Um, I just want to stress that this is really just a, it's a common sense clarification of the law. And um, it, it does remove uh, uncertainty and, and we've, what, what comes of the uncertainty is need, needless litigation. So um, you've heard others testify about the, uh, the court case. Um, the Supreme, state Supreme Court was pretty emphatic uh, in rejecting uh, an argument that if, if a, a stream is not on the public water's inventory, um, that it can't be, um, even if it meets the definition, it can't be protected. That was rejected, and the court gave direction, like, let's, you know, uh, clarify things so there's no more confusion because what it results in is just expensive, time-consuming litigation. Um, I think the end result and that litigation will be the same in each case. The, the court has said it's the statutory definition. So um, 
We just think this is really a good common sense approach. It, it saves taxpayers a lot of money on both sides of litigation. Uh, we're strong proponents of it. Um, and then I just want to say, you know, why this matters, why it matters for me and our members. I mean, we're anglers. We also drink water, hopefully clean water. And so um, it matters a lot because um, having it being a public water provides some degree of protection. Uh, even those small headwater streams are really important. They uh, store water, they clean water, they deliver clean water downstream uh, for both drinking and fishing. Um, and so real important, again, we think this is a pretty common sense um, uh, solution to some uncertainty and needless litigation. And um, again, we thank Senator Kunish for the bill and we urge your support. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lancheski. And we'll move to the next testifier. Uh, this one is online on Zoom. Oh, that person? Okay. Okay. Correction. Uh, Mr. Cementek, Minnesota Soybean Grower Association. And welcome. When you're, when you're ready, please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, my name is Joe Smentek. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Soybean Growers Association. I'm here actually to testify against this uh, change to the statute. Uh, my, my organization, along with Minnesota Corn and other ag groups, were involved in the, the, as amicus brief participants in the lawsuit on Limbo Creek. Uh, and really, we do not believe that this will add the clarity and the, the clarity and eliminate confusion as has been said, stated, uh, and that's simply because my landowners, uh, you know, we, we have the buffer law. The buffer law definition, uh, when we were working through that in 2015, started with defined bed and bank, evidence of flow, uh, very technical terms, a lot of hydrology terms coming out of agencies that my farmers were not able to really, does my water meet that? I don't know. And so we settled on a definition of public water in the public water inventory. And that gave my farmers a very clear tool to look at a map and be able to say, yes, it is a public water. No, it isn't a public water. Uh, with that clear tool, we've got over 98% compliance very rapidly within a one-year time frame after that law went into effect. Uh, these, there are other places in the statute where public waters are are implicated. Under 103G.231, uh, farmers can use public waters during a period of drought. Uh, this does not help my farmer know, is this drain two square miles or does this body of water not drain two square miles? Can I use this in a time of drought or can I not? Uh, the map provides that clarity. This definition does not do that. My farmer is going to find out that that dried out wetland that he may have cropped during a period of drought or not drought. Um, that he has been doing, he's going to find out that's a public water through expensive litigation. He's not going to be able to ascertain that on his own. The map would give him this clarity. Uh, it's our position that if there are problems with the map that led to this confusion, if there are problems with the inventory that led to this confusion, we should be fixing those, not changing the definition um, that really doesn't give my farmers, my members, any more tools to be able to ascertain clearly whether something that is next to their land is a public water or not. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mintak. Before I go on the remote, just want to put on the record and uh, um, want members to know that we do have a letter from Association of Minnesota Counties. Um, Public Water Protection, the Sierra Club, and uh, Ms. Minnesota Child Unlimited that we have here. So. Now, I suppose this will give us um, a little time to to move to the remote uh, member, uh, the, the, the remote uh, uh, testifiers. Uh, I'd like to call on Ms. Fershaw, Peck Fershaw. So if you're online, um, please unmute yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Peg Fershawn, and I'm here to testify in favor of House File 3358. I am the Director of Programs at CURE in Montevideo. CURE is a nonprofit organization that has worked on water issues 
in Minnesota since 1992. The public waters fix is not just an administrative issue. It has real world impacts on people across communities in greater Minnesota. One afternoon, I was driving home from work and I saw a backhoe out near Limbo Creek, which is about a third of a mile northwest of our family farm in Renville County. I was surprised and I felt compelled to know what was going on. Renville County has more miles of ditches than it actually has miles of roads. And this section of Limbo Creek near our home is one of the last free flowing public waters in the entire county. I learned that because Limbo Creek was not correctly identified on the public waters inventory, that it was vulnerable to be ditched by a local landowner She's muted herself. Uh, Ms. Uh, Fershaw, can you unmute yourself? I, we just we lost you about 30 seconds ago. Okay. So you could go back 30 seconds and then uh, continue from there. Thank you. The Minnesota Supreme Court 2022 decision protects Limbo Creek, but it does not address over 600 miles of public waters that meet the statutory definition of a public water and that are not on the DNR public water inventory. In my capacity at CURE, I see that our constituents across the state of Minnesota care deeply about water and they look to CURE when it comes to protecting our natural resources. This is why CURE joined MCEA and others to intervene on behalf of Limbo Creek. While Minnesota may be the land of 10,000 lakes, much of our water is at risk. Furthermore, as we look to the challenges that we face in the future with drought and climate impacts, it's imperative that we accurately identify the state's water resources and protect those resources for future generations. We're not asking you to eliminate the public waters inventory tool. We're asking you to support updating it and uh, maintaining the tool. We ask that you extend the outcome of the Limbo Creek decision to ensure that Minnesota public waters are correctly identified and protected across the state. We'd like to thank uh, the committee and the chair for allowing me to testify and for Senate Senator Kunish for bringing the bill forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fershon. Uh, next on our remote testimony is Mr. Spallen from Coalition for Clean Minnesota River. If you are online now, please unmute yourself uh, and introduce your name for the record. Chair, Vice Chair McEwen and committee members, thank you for hearing my testimony on Senate File 3558, Defining Public Waters. <clears throat> my name is Scott Sparlin. I'm the Executive Director of the Coalition for a Clean Minnesota River coordinator facilitator for the Minnesota River Congress and giving testimony today on behalf of the Minnesota River Collaborative. This is my 35th year of working on Minnesota River watershed issues. I'm here today to ask you to begin the process of clarification for the definitions of a public water in the state of Minnesota. This has been a long-standing point of contention in Minnesota and a source of litigation that does not have to exist if proper clarity is established by law. In 2022, the Minnesota Supreme Court affirmed that public waters belong to all of us, and as such, we have a voice in how pro a project impacts us. In the decision, the state's high court agreed with the Court of Appeals that the upper watershed of Limbo Creek is a public water because it meets the statutory definition of a public water. The statute defines public waters to include natural and altered water courses with total drainage area greater than two square miles. These public waters protections are critical to CCMR and the collaborative's work in the Minnesota Basin. This is because in such a completely drained watershed like the Minnesota River, which has so many sediment and nutrient load impairments, it is especially important to ensure that public waters protections like the DNR permits required for all water courses that meet the statutory definition of a public water. This is also important to every Minnesota citizen in all parts of the state and will create understanding and awareness for landowners. The court further stated in its decision that it's the duty of the legislature to clarify the relationship 
between the public waters inventory and the statute definition of public waters. We are here today to ask that the legislature take on that clarification once and for all in order to further avoid pitting neighbor against neighbor, <coughs> rural resident against urban or a homeowner, lakeshore property owner against agricultural producer, and the list goes on. The clarification of the definition needs to address and eliminate any vagueness of language in the statute. Definitions need to consider potential attempts to circumvent the law by using alternative terminologies which are not within the spirit and the intent of the law. If this can be achieved, not only will it provide for enhanced public water resource protection, but over time, it will help achieve a degree of cultural harmony and awareness by discouraging covert natural resource modifications as a byproduct. Thank you, Chair Herr, Vice Chair McEwen, and members of the committee. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, and thank you to Senator Kunish for bringing this bill forward. Thank you, Mr. Sparlin. Uh, next on remote is Mr. Jim Schill. A seal. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for allowing me to testify today in support of Senate File 3558. My name is Jim Seal and I live in Garvin, Minnesota, way in the far southwest corner of the state. I worked 34 years as a hydrologist with Minnesota DNR in this part of the state. My entire career focused on public water management. As such, I have a large amount of public water experience, including dealing with the errors on the public water inventory maps. The quality of the PWI maps are actually quite good considering the techno technological limitations that existed in the early 80s, 1980s when they were developed. They had inferior quality aerial photographs, low resolution topographic maps, a short time period to complete the inventory, and limited staff that were able to work on the maps. A few examples of the errors that it are on the maps right now are public water basins, wetlands that are mislocated. They're not in the correct location. There are public water basins, wetlands, and water courses that were completely missed during the mapping process. Public water water courses that were incorrectly identified as county ditches and county ditches which are incorrectly identified as public water water courses. There are even instances where water courses that do not meet the definition of public waters are shown on the public water inventory maps, and these should be removed. So it goes both ways on that. The language contained in Senate File 3558 will simply modify the statute to acknowledge that the current PWI maps are not 100% dependable. We need to update the maps with current technology to clarify what is and what is not public water. I strongly encourage the committee to pass this bill on and ensure it becomes law. I would also recommend the committee request DNR to update the PWI maps in a timely manner. Thank you. I'll take any questions that the committee has. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Sill. And those online and uh, those who are here, uh, do stay on. Case member, have any questions? Um, following a few more testimony, if I can see if there's any from the mem from the audience, if any in the audience that want to testify for or against this legislation, do come forth. Okay. So now, members, Senator House House. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Senator Kunish, for bringing this forward. It seems like we have obviously a problem with this list excluding some waters, and there being sort of disputes about what is public waters because the list is not adequate. Is that correct at a summary level, Senator Kunish? Um, I think that that that's part of it, yeah. and it's because the um, the definition has not been clear enough so that there's um, really controversy about what makes it public waters and whatnot. Okay. 
follow up, Senator House. Mr. Shall. Chair, Senator Kunish. So, if this law goes into place and there continues to be a dispute, who decides what a public water is if we don't have a list held by DNR? It sounds like there's some technology, there's other ways we can do this, but I'm just, it just feels like we're opening up almost a larger dispute opportunity here, unless I'm missing something. S Senator Kunish, are your, your uh, support members? Well, I think it does open up a lot of discussion because obviously, just as we heard from um, from our testifiers, um, that there has been misidentification, whether right. something is a ditch or whether it's a stream, whether it's here or whether it's there. And so this is all part of the process of identifying, first of all, by defining what is a public water and then looking at these, these different bodies of water or streams or ditches in order to define is this actually you know, a, a public water or not. But um, I will leave it to the expert. Ms. Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, this bill really isn't a, a sea change that some might make it seem to be. There is a statutory definition in 103G005 subdivision 15 that has existed since 1979. Um, that was also the year when the legislature mandated the creation of a list and map for the public waters inventory. But they have always existed separate from each other. None of the um, subdivisions within that statutory definition refer to or are limited by what is on the inventory. And we fully, this is no way meant to make the inventory disappear or to undercut the validity of the inventory. Um, to the contrary, we think that it should be updated to be the most accurate possible. But in instances where there is a discrepancy, and we've heard several specific examples of those today, between what is on the inventory and what, is, what meets the statutory definition, this would clarify that it's the statutory definition that governs the scope of the state's jurisdiction. And maybe just one follow-up, yes, Mr. Follow Chair, up, and then Senator I promise Hoffman. I'll be done. Uh, so in that case, uh, if someone is disputing whether or not something is a public land, they have to use litigation. There's, not, there's no longer going to be a list, so it would just go straight to litigation based on the statute to figure out what, what it is and what, is, what isn't Griffin. the public water. Mr. Chair and members, there, um, so there would still, still be an inventory and a list for right. reference, but uh, because the Department of Natural Resources is the regulatory authority with jurisdiction over public water's impacts, um, you know, anytime something like a, a drainage project, for example, wants to proceed, there's a drainage engineer who is involved, and there are tools now to quickly identify if there is that discrepancy. In many cases, there won't be a discrepancy between the list and the statutory definition. But if there is, those tools can verify if it meets the statutory definition, and then it would be the Department of Natural Resources that would have jurisdiction over that decision. Okay. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I think uh, as much uh, oftentimes here in the legislature, we hear one side of the story. Um, I am well versed with Limbo Creek, uh, believe it or not, and Senator Kunish, I actually had a bill somewhat similar to this bill where I talked about the public waters inventory and how it affected uh, my area, my district, that is getting a lot of uh, attention in this committee hearing this afternoon that I didn't see coming necessarily. And I do, uh, and this is something where, uh, you know, Bob Meyer and I had this conversation several years ago, the public waters inventory. The problem I see, and there's a lot of information about Limbo Creek that's being left out from you now. And it starts with the public waters inventory done, uh, the, whether it was the section 103 that was in 1979, the problem that we have is that the part of Limbo Creek that is now in the public waters inventory did not exist in, at that time, did not exist when the first public waters inventory was created. So what happened was that a government agency uh, dammed up the creek and, and used it uh, to create wetland, to create a uh, waterfall management area or an, uh, a publicly owned space. But the problem with that was is it backed up thousands of acres backed up thousands of acres of farmland high into the watershed. 
And we had landowners, farmers that came to me, that came to the county, and were concerned by that. It's like, how are we going to take care of all this water? This water is being backed up. It's not draining through Limbo Creek like it like used to. And if anybody really knows Limbo Creek, you can almost jump across it. It's not that big of a piece of body of water. Um, so what happened? The DNR, the Army Corps of Engineers, the county, uh, there was even uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife that was all come together to say, okay, we're going to put some sort of a water control uh, feature and, and do that and drain this off so this land returns to the way it was. Now, a member of the MCEA filed a lawsuit against the DNR to force them to make this public waters. Now, I agree with your bill on concept. Senator Kunish, I truly do. Mm -hmm. I think the public waters inventory probably should have some sort of a mechanism where we can look at that and to quote you to say, we use those GIS pieces to look at it mm -hmm. and say, here it is. Let's lay it out there. These are public waters. These are the public waters as we see them the best way we can and leave it that way. Not so that three years from now when a field floods and we use, you know, an overhead picture to see that and say, now that's on the public waters inventory, we need to add that. And there's a couple of other things that go along with this, and I think Senator Hochschild touched on it a little bit, and he probably shares a little bit of the same concern I do, is when we look at this bill, we see something that an agency could say, that soil that you had crops on three years ago now is underwater, so it's public waters inventory, and we not only have the 16 and a half foot buffer strip, but now we have a 50 foot standoff because it's public waters. So. I think the concept, the idea of the bill is good. I truly think it is. But this, this one line change gives the, D, the DNR, an agency of the state, the ability to change the public waters inventory at any given point in time. And that's probably not a great thing. If we have a substantial flood, if we have waters that back up over years and it takes years to fix it, is, is that now public waters? If I dig a pond in my yard, is that now public waters? It's, it's kind of arbitrary, and I think you touched on that, Senator Hochschild, when you were talking earlier. So, and, and I think you can see that when you have the Association of Minnesota Counties. All the counties come together and say, hey, we see a little gray area in this, and we're concerned by it. We don't know how we're going to be able to adapt to that. And truly, it's probably a lot of work for the DNR to, to do this work. So, when I look at the bill, um, I guess I, I'd maybe be questioning the author and, and asking the author, is this something where you could put a, uh, a, 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 even a vocal amendment and say, by 2030, I want to have a good idea of what the public waters inventory is. We're going to get all those drainage ditches off of it. We're going to get the streams that belong on the public water inventory, on the inventory, and that's the way it's going to be. You know, barring any 50-year flood that just changes the landscape in such a way that we need to change it, uh, and then they could come back to the legislature. But I think there needs to be a cap on this. I think we as a group of stakeholders in this room and a group of stakeholders, whether they file suit against an agency in a county or not, I think the facts of the case need to matter. And I think we need to have some sort of say in this other than handing it to the agency uh, carte blanche from here on out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Lane. Um, any follow remark? Uh, Ms. Griffin. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. If you read the uh, September 2022 Supreme Court decision, it does say that um, the uh, uh, upper reaches of Limbo Creek were depicted both on the original 1979 public waters inventory map that was submitted to Renville County and the final map that was released in 1985 uh, depicted as both a public water and uh, part of a public ditch. There was um, some, uh, the there was some, there was a, pitch, a ditch petition process underway that never came to fruition, which is part of some of the confusion between the map and the list on the inventory for that particular water body. But it was, uh, it was depicted on both that original 1979 map and the 1985 uh, map. And I, and I will just also say we, we think that an updated inventory is a really important part of this issue and we support updates to the inventory. However, it has been quite a slow process and there has um, been litigation from counties against the Department of Natural Resources that challenge its authority to make those additions. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Uh, Senator, Senator uh, Wiesenberg. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have I have concerns also, as you were touching on, that this is going to lead to taking of land, and how is this going to impact farmers, uh, along with the I think what was the other bill number three five three five five nine with Bowser? It seems like there are some changes in there that we're unclear of what may happen now. I feel like we may be forcing farmers to turn land back into wetlands and then this bill is gonna say no it's a wetland and they're gonna have they're gonna be losing property and losing um, egg land. Uh, so I can't support this bill as it is right now. Thank you. And members this bill will be lay over so we would not vote but but uh, would encourage you know a um, good discussion on this bill. Any Senator Hoffman Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm, I'm glad to hear you're laying it over because there are some inconsistencies, and I think it needs to get some of that comprehensive, uh, collaborative conversation going. And I would hope that um, the author and, and the folks that are bringing this bill forward, and I was just wondering, you know, where is it at in the other body? Not that I care about the other body, but I do know, you know, is the same conversation going there. But what, what I heard Senator Housechild and, and Senator Lang uh, bring up, um, yeah, I can I can see where that, uh, especially with the fact of the, the properties of Senate District 34 and the Mississippi River and all the attributes that fall in and off of that place and how much the water goes up and goes down, it's pretty beyond. And so you want to be very clear about where we're going on this because it's going to be a systemic change. And so, you know, I like the ideas of well, maybe you look out a couple of years, maybe you get, you know, more process in there. But uh, I would hope that by the time it comes back to your, mm -hmm. you know, right up that that all that stuff has been settled out so it's good to know you're just going to lay it over so thank you thank you senator hoffman uh, senator McHugh. thank you mr chair and thank you senator kunish and the advocates for bringing this bill forward um this has sort of been an interesting discussion i um have not read the supreme court decision but based on the letters that i see before me and the testimony that we've heard i feel that <clears throat> this seems pretty cut and dried to me. We have um, other statutory definitions um, of public waters. And as I read this, and please tell me if I'm wrong, all this is saying is something can still be considered a public water if it's not on the list because of an error, right? There's other places in the law that describe what a public water is, and that can be controlling rather than some list that was created and is perhaps not maintained the way that we want it to be because of resources. So um, this seems very common sense to me. I'm not having the same concerns that I'm hearing some of the other members have. And so any changes, I'll also be watching to see if there are any changes to this as it goes into possible inclusion in our omnibus bill. Um, just to make sure that we're not creating any other strange new limitations on the definitions that currently exist in law. Um, so thank you for bringing this clarifying legislation. I hope that we're making um, you know, a, a lot out of nothing, um, but I, I'll be watching also to see if there are any changes that go forward, but thank you. Senator Kunish, any closing remark? Um, thank you for this very uh, in-depth and lively um, discussion. If anything, I, I see this bill as an additional protection, not just for, for private lands or private owners, but um, also for the public. If there have been spaces that have been left off of that definition, uh, we are now able to have a clear, defined um, uh, decision about is this public uh, public waters, is this not, how is this going to be used, how is it going to be um, protected in different ways, whether it's an individual uh, homeowner or whether it's public waters. And so if anything, this provides much more clarity than confusion. And uh, I, I hope that as we go forward, um, we will move this into, to, um, you know, into our law so that there isn't that, that confusion or that discrepancy as time goes by. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Quinnish, and thank you, members, for an engaging discussion. And we'll move on um, and get this bill laid over. Um, so in a former, formal um, lang language uh, for this bill, I move that Senator Fowle 
3558 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. So next is uh, Senate File 3561, uh, Senator M Morrison, Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act. Yes, while she, uh, Senator Morrison walked to the podium, I'd just like to uh, ask Council Dan, Dan Mueller to you know, give us a little insight on the fiscal aspect of this legislation. Um, Mr. Chairman and members, um, you'll note that in your packet there is currently not a fiscal note for this bill. Um, this bill definitely has one requested. Um, the fiscal note for this bill was originally requested when it was put on the agenda. Since then, as you'll notice, the date on the delete everything amendment that was posted yesterday, there's been a number of changes to the bill. Um, so as soon as this committee is done working on the bill, there will be a new fiscal note um, requested for the bill. I believe the bill has other stops and will come back to this committee. And when it comes back to this committee, the fis we'll, we will have a completed fiscal note and be able to address some of the fiscal issues in the bill and the mechanisms for how the money flows between the fees and the, how it works with the um, Pollution Control Agency. So again, there's no completed fiscal note on the bill right now, but there is one coming. Okay, welcome, uh, Sarah Morrison. And I, I believe you have an, a delete all amendment. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Up. Chair. I do have a delete all A3 amendment, and then I have an amendment to the amendment. Okay. <laughs> And members, the delete all is in your package and is was uh, Amendment A3 and it was posted online prior to our committee here. So uh, I'd like to ask Senator McCune to move the A3 amendment to Senate File 3561 be adopted. So moved. Okay, all in favor say aye. Hi. Opposed? Didn't hear anything, so motion prevail. Okay, on to the bill or your know, oral amendment, Senator Morrison. So, Mr. Chair, we just adopted the A3, the A3. right? And now yes. I'd like to offer the A8 to amend the, the A3. Okay, coming before you, members, is the A8 amendment. I'd like to ask Senator Kulish to uh, move the A8 amendment to Senate 531 be adopted. So moved. So move. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion prevail. Okay. So, Senator Morrison, I know today has been a, a Exciting, a long day, depending on how you see it. But it's been a, a, a day with full responsibility for you. So on to the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members, Senate File 3561 as amended is a bill that establishes a producer-funded system to reduce packaging and single-use plastic, make recycling easier, and lower taxpayer costs for managing waste. The bill has been an incredibly collaborative effort, years in the making, and I want to thank everyone who has provided input and helped bring this language together. You will hear from many of them today. And special thanks to Mr. Ben Stanley for all of your work to incorporate the many changes and additions to the bill as stakeholders weighed in with suggestions. So Senate File 3561 establishes a producer-funded system to reduce packaging and single-use plastic, making recycling easier and lowering taxpayer costs for managing waste. E-commerce and the delivery economy have led to a dramatic increase in packaging waste, now accounting for 40% of our waste stream. Despite increasing awareness and public pressure, plastic production continues to increase and is expected to double in the next 20 years. 
In the metro area alone, the amount of waste generated is projected to grow by 19% over the next two decades if we don't act now to curb this trend. And despite our best efforts, recycling rates in Minnesota have been stagnant for a decade. This bill establishes a system where brand owners pay the cost of recycling, which will have several effects. It will create an incentive for producers to reduce waste and stop using materials that are difficult to recycle. It will decrease the environmental contamination of our drinking water, our fisheries, our land, and our air, as well as climate impacts from manufacturing, packaging, and the disposal of these materials in landfills or incinerators. And it will create a stable and sustainable approach for funding community recycling programs that does not rely on property tax dollars or residential recycling fees, dollars that are needed elsewhere, saving taxpayers millions of dollars. With that, Mr. Chair, I would uh, like to ask Mr. Stanley to briefly walk us through the bill. Mr. Stanley. Mr. Chair, members, good afternoon. Um, as the chair mentioned, I'm going to be describing the A3 amendment, which is in your packets and posted online. I want to also draw your attention to the summary that's posted online, which will go into greater detail than what I'm about to do here. As Senator Morrison said, at the highest level, this bill would create a statewide system for collecting and managing packaging and paper product waste through reuse, recycling, and composting. That system would be structured as follows. The materials to be managed through the system are referred to as covered materials. Producers of those materials are required under the bill to create and finance what the bill refers to as producer responsibility organizations. I'll be calling those PROs, so I don't have to say that every time I talk about them. Those PROs, in turn, implement what the bill calls stewardship plans, which facilitate the collection and management of covered materials through contracts with service providers. So that's the bill at a 30,000-foot level. At a 10,000-foot level, sections one through three require the establishment of the program, define various terms, and establish the short title for the bill. Section four requires PROs to annually register with and pay fees to the PCA, that's the Pollution Control Agency, to cover the agency's cost of administering the program. Section five establishes a producer responsibility advisory board to advise and comment on various aspects of the act's implementation. And then section six through 10 set forth the responsibilities of the main parties uh, under the bill. So section six addresses the responsibilities of the commissioner of the Pollution Control Agency. Those duties include appointing the membership of the advisory board, completing needs assessments, approving stewardship plans and amendments, and maintaining a list of recyclable and compostable covered materials. Section seven lists the duties of the producer responsibility advisory board. And those duties largely consist of consulting with the commissioner and PROs on needs assessments, stewardship plans, and other matters. Section eight, <coughs> excuse me, section eight establishes the duties of the PROs themselves, and those include registering with the commissioner, submitting and implementing stewardship plans, and collecting producer fees. Section nine imposes duties on producers under the act which include registering with a PRO and operating under approved stewardship plans. And finally, Section 10 imposes duties on service providers under the bill, which largely consist of collecting and managing covered materials pursuant to contractual arrangements with PROs. Section 11 requires the commissioner to conduct a needs assessment every five years to examine what the state needs are in this area. Section 12 governs the contents of stewardship plans and requires that they be submitted every five years. These plans have to include a description of collection methods, performance targets, third-party certifications, a budget, producer fees, an infrastructure investment plan, service agreement terms, and other items. Section 13 requires the commissioner to complete a list of covered materials that are recyclable or compostable statewide and to revise that list every three years. And then for sections 14 through 22 impose various additional requirements under the Act. Section 14 governs the setting of producer fees. Those fees have to be set at a level that generates revenue sufficient to cover the costs of the program. 
and are supposed to be based on the total amount of covered products that a given producer introduces into the state. And section 15 governs the content of service agreements between service providers and PROs. Section 16 includes reporting requirements. Section 17 includes requirements for PRO websites, which have to have certain information maintained on them. Section 18 clarifies that PROs aren't violating antitrust laws. Section 19 is rulemaking authority for the PCA to implement the act. Section 20 imposes a duty to provide information necessary to facilitate compliance with the act. Section 21 states that it's the intent of the legislature that if a bottle return system is ever implemented, that it be harmonized with this act. And section 22 provides various enforcement mechanisms. And finally, Mr. Chair, sections 23 and 24 require the commissioner to undertake a workplace condition study in this industry, as well as a study, a second study, to identify the contribution of covered materials to litter and water pollution in Minnesota. And that is what the DE3 does, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. Uh, now on to the testifiers. We have a sizable number in person, and we have a few that will be connecting with us on, from, from remote, remote. So um, I'd like to call the first testifier here first, and if they're not here, we will check with them before the testimony end. Uh, the first person is uh, Ramsey County Commissioner Victoria Reinhardt. Chair, yeah, she's here. Welcome, Commissioner. And Nell Pawson, yep. So let's start with uh, Commissioner Reinhardt. Please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Chair Herr. I'm Ramsey County Commissioner Victoria Reinhardt, and I am Chair of the Partnership on Waste and Energy, which is a collaboration of Hennepin, Ramsey, and Washington Counties. And I want to thank Senator Morrison for her leadership in carrying this bill, and I thank you, Chair Herr, for scheduling this hearing. I am pleased to be here today to talk to you about Senate File 3561, the Packaging, Waste, and Cost Reduction Act. It is so important to counties. Counties are responsible under state law, as you know, for assuring responsible management of waste. We are working very hard with our cities, recyclers, residents, and businesses to keep as much waste out of landfills as possible. Counties spend four to five times more on recycling efforts than we receive in state funding through SCORE grants. Cities raise tens of millions of dollars annually in taxes and fees to operate their recycling programs. Even though Minnesota's current recycling rate is one of the best in the country, our recycling rates have been stuck around 40% for many years. These are resources that could be recycled or composted, are instead creating mountains of trash in landfills. And bear in mind, for the metro area, the recycling goal is 75% uh, by 2030. And again, we're stuck at the 40% rate. We need to get the state out of business as usual and get us to the next level to meet recycling, state recycling mandates and our zero waste ambitions. The Packaging, Waste, and Cost Reduction Act brings packaging and paper product producers to the table. They will have skin in the game to help fix the waste problem that they've created. Producer resources will reduce the financial burden significantly on counties, cities, and taxpayers for recycling programs. Producers are called to bring solutions to help reach our environmental goals, building on the state's existing recycling infrastructure with producers, not taxpayers, funding the gaps that we are losing recyclables now, where we are losing recyclables now. There are a few of, these are just a few of the many reasons this act is so important to counties. I respectfully ask that the committee approve Senate File 3561 and put Minnesota on the path to greater success in waste reduction, reuse, recycling, and composting. Thank you, and um, I would thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions now or at the end. Thank you very much for your testimony. I think that we'll go ahead because we have a number of testifiers today and just continue on and, and, um, and then have some questions and discussion afterward. But thank you very much for thank your you. testimony. 
Um, next on our list uh, for testifiers, we have uh, Mr. Nels Paulson. Uh, welcome to the Senate Environment Committee. And after, I will just say, um, after that on our list, we have Kirk Kudelka. So if um, Mr. Kudelka would like to come up and um, as soon as there's another open chair. Mr. Paulson. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. My name is Nels Paulson, and I serve as the Policy Director at Conservation Minnesota. We are a statewide nonprofit advocacy organization with members in all 87 of Minnesota's counties. We advocate at the state capitol on issues our members tell us are, are important to them, and this includes policies involving recycling and garbage. I'll begin by reiterating the problem. We have a trash problem. We now know that burying or burning our trash is not a sustainable long-term solution. We know that we need to stop feeding landfills and incinerators like the Hennepin Energy Recovery Center, or HERC. While recycling rates have been stuck around 40 to 45% for years, the amount of trash we generate is growing. The MPCA tells us that the amount of trash generated in the metro is expected to grow almost 20% by 2042. Over about the same time, global plastic production is expected to double, and we are running out of landfill capacity to manage our trash problem. We need solutions. One important piece of the puzzle is the Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act. We participated in years of stakeholder meetings and bill development because we recognize the importance of getting this bill right. The fingerprints of dozens of stakeholders are on this bill. This bill will make significant progress by disincentivizing single-use plastics and wasteful packaging by implementing eco-modulated fees. Strong performance targets are the backbone of this bill and will ensure that over time, producers finally become accountable to reducing wasteful packaging and single-use plastics. The bill proposes that by 2032, all packaging must be recyclable, reusable, or compostable. This is a remarkable target and one that will make producers accountable and responsible for the products they make and package. This accountability of producers is lacking in our current system. You may hear testifiers from industry who oppose this bill and say things like, let's only do a study. We don't need waste reduction targets in statute. My reply is that without strong performance targets or goals in statute, we don't know what we're striving for. Strong goals are fundamental to this bill. In summary, our statewide trash and recycling problems are complex, and this will require diverse and innovative policies to push us towards zero waste. This act is a major piece of the puzzle to get Minnesota on track. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pawson. Uh, next is Mr. Kodelka, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And, uh, I want to encourage uh, Gabby Bat Batsko to come up as well when the seat is open. Go ahead, introduce yourself for the record, Ms. Mr. K uh, Kodelka. Thank you, Chair and Committee Members. For the record, my name is Kirk Kodelka. I'm Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. I want to thank the author and the committee for this bill. MPCA supports the bill and wishes to continue working with the author as it moves through the process. While Minnesota is a waste reduction, recycling, and composting leader, we still have a ways to go to reach out the goals set out by the legislature and the Waste Management Act. Collectively, we have a 5.9 million ton trash problems each year, and that number is only expected to grow, as we mentioned. 45% of that waste is either recycled or composted, which means the over half is still ending up at a waste energy facility or a landfill. This results in negative environmental, human health, and economic impacts. An example is, for instance, Minnesota saves the equivalent of 4.6 million metric tons of carbon dioxide due to our current waste reduction, recycling, and composting activities. The bill would look to increase that. Just to put that in perspective, that's similar to 970,000 passenger vehicles being taken off the road and their impacts. Reducing, reusing, and recycling waste reduces greenhouse gas emissions while landfilling increases them. There's also a loss of economic benefit from our throwing away nearly a million tons of recyclable materials each year. The value of those materials is $143 million, which could sustain new and expanded businesses and create an estimated 15,000 plus jobs. While Minnesota does have a strong base when compared to other states, it's important that our extended producer responsibility program, like the one proposed here, builds off it 
and results in more than just efficiencies and changes in who's covering the cost. Rather, we want to see <coughs> provisions in, the, in a program to expand our waste prevention, reuse, and recycling programs, and more importantly, look at the results. This is where the strong provisions in this bill related to waste reduction, reuse, and statewide performance requirements are so important. It will make sure that we're advancing in these areas instead of just changing who's doing the work. While there have been some concerns to having statewide recycling targets and requirements, there are a few important reasons that they need to be in the bill. First of all, it's important for MPCA to have a target and requirement to carry out a number of provisions within the bill. For instance, determining the quality of the plan and compliance with the law. We want this to be an outcomes-based program and not just checking the box to determine whether certain things were done or not. Also, the legislature has set a 75% recycling goal for the metro area by 2030. That's earlier than the bill. The author gives the producers more time to, to carry this out. The bill also allows the MPCA to adjust these numbers by 5% after the needs assessment. And two other states have similar targets and requirements built into their law to provide this direction for the producer responsibility organization. Lastly, we just want to highlight on the cost savings. The public and local governments are providing um, that are provided recycling services will see savings in a number of areas. First of all, those paying directly for curbside recycling will see the cost of their monthly bill um, covered by the PRO, the Producer Responsibility Organization, because the collection and processing of those materials are now covered by them. That will be a reduction on everyone's monthly bill. Cities that are providing curbside recycling will see those costs covered. An example is Virginia, Minnesota. They this month dropped their curbside collection of recycling mm -hmm because of the 400,000 plus cost it was to their budget. They could no longer afford it. Under this bill, the PRO would cover those costs and provide those residents with the, the services. Counties spend an estimation of $31.5 million on recycling alone in 2022. While we don't have an exact breakdown of these expenses, a vast majority of these are county services that the, including packaging items that would then be covered under the, the bill. Thank you, Chair and committee members for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kudelka. Uh, next is uh, Ms. Basco, uh, Gabby Basco. And um, I, I also like to ask Ms. Molani to come forth to join at the table as well. So go ahead, Ms. Basco, uh, introduce yourself for the record. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, I'm Gabby Batsko, coordinator for the Tri-County Solid Waste Commission of Stearns, Benton, and Sherburne Counties. Um, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Minnesota Solid Waste Administrators Association, or SWA, where I'm serving as the president-elect. SWA is an organization of county and solid waste district professionals and related waste specialists, and is an affiliate of the Association of Minnesota Counties, or AMC, which represents all of Minnesota's 87 counties. SWA advocates for policies that improve and promote responsible waste management um, of solid waste. Uh, SWA and AMC support product stewardship among manufacturers, retailers, and consumers with an emphasis on industry through an extended producer responsibility framework, or EPR. For the 2024 session, uh, SWA has prioritized action to move the dial on a significant segment of the waste stream, which is packaging. The EPA has stated that in 2020, 2021, roughly 15% of methane produced in the United States came from landfills. And in Minnesota, waste is landfilled in counties th throughout the state, both in the metro and in greater Minnesota. Um, this is while well, recycling rates have remained stagnant. If we don't start advancing solutions to our waste problem in all forms, waste will continue to be unnecessarily landfilled, greenhouse gas emissions will continue to rise, and all Minnesotans will feel the impacts of a rapidly changing world due to this inaction. SWA supports a producer-led material re reduction, reuse, repair, and recycling program to reduce a product's life cycle impacts, impacts on the environment and public health. And that's consistent with the Minnesota waste hierarchy, a hierarchy that prioritizes reduction and reuse of waste and urges us away from landfilling. EPR must include transparency and accountability measures, maximize and build off of existing infrastructure, and provide local governments with a voluntary role in development and displace taxpayer funding for recycling and reuse. We support the Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act and believe it will lead to an improved recyclability of product packaging 
a reduction in packaging waste, and incentivize sustainable packaging choices, all of which are necessary to meet our state's waste goals and our state's climate goals, such as clean econ economy outlined in Minnesota's Climate Ac Action Framework. Um, if you have any waste-related questions speci specific to your districts, um, you can feel free to reach out any time, um, and SWAT encourage your encourages your support um, of Senate file 3561. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Basco. So next is uh, Ms. Uh, Molani. Uh, before you testify, I'd like to call Mr. Uh, Del Thomas to come to the, sit on the empty seat first. So go ahead, uh, Ms. Molani, introduce your uh, self uh, for the record and go ahead with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair uh, and members of the committee. And um, thank you to Senator Morrison for her commitment to these issues. I'm Lucy Milani. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy with Eureka Recycling. We're a nonprofit social enterprise recycler here in the Twin Cities, and we're one of the largest recyclers in the state. We're a, pr a proud union shop with union mechanics and drivers. Our team sorts 100,000 tons of recyclables each year into 15 different commodities that support our local supply chains. Uh, about 80% of our feedstock is turned into new products here in Minnesota and 90% in the greater Midwest. We work to demonstrate that recycling can and should be done in ways that benefit the environment, communities, and the regional economy. Unfortunately, the growing packaging crisis is making this work increasingly difficult. Problematic and unnecessary packaging is trashing our recycling system, adding unnecessary costs to our communities and polluting our environment. This bill holds producers responsible for these impacts and drives them toward much needed changes. Additionally, the bill provides some stability to the commodity markets uh, by including strong minimum requirements for recycled contents. We've worked closely with the author to make sure it protects the open and fair bidding process that haulers like us and haulers across the state are accustomed to and ensures that priority is given to service providers here in Minnesota that provide good jobs, strong safety standards, and quality services. Uh, and the bill also sets targets for source reduction and reuse. I cannot stress enough that we cannot recycle and compost our way out of the packaging crisis. We need a fundamental shift towards reduction and reuse systems. The targets included in the bill are appropriate to build off of the successful progress that we've made as a state, and we um, thank and support the agency's position on these targets. Over the coming weeks, we'll continue to work to strengthen the bill. Efforts to weaken this bill risk uh, simply shifting the cost of recycling without ushering in systematic improvements to community and environment. Um, and I want to thank you for your time. We've provided additional details in our written testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mulani. And uh, I'd like to call Ms. Bailey uh, forward and uh, now ask that uh, Mr. De Thomas uh, introduce yourself and uh, present your testimony. Thank you, Chair Herr and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dylan DeThomas, and I represent the Recycling Partnership. I'm testifying in support of Senate File 3561. I lead state policy work for the Recycling Partnership, a national nonprofit that collaborates with communities, policymakers, and more than 80 companies uh, from around the globe to invest in and, and strengthen public recycling programs across the country. We work with those companies, many of them Fortune 500 companies, some of them headquartered here in Minnesota, to insist and assist them to uphold their sustainability goals to serve people and the planet. Those goals include minimum recycled content levels, packaging recyclability goals, and climate goals. The circular economy cannot be achieved without, with, by recycling alone, but it can't be done without recycling. It also can't be done without policies like EPR. Our research shows that EPR, like this bill, can deliver huge gains in recycling rates of over 65% for the state, returning hundreds of thousands of tons of recyclable materials to market, reinjecting more than $20 million in lost material value into the economy annually, and creating jobs across the state, rescuing those materials from being buried in a landfill or burned in an incinerator. Some have and will mistakenly argue that EPR increased costs to consumers. We have engaged in robust research in every major market around the world where EPR 
uh, laws like this have been implemented, we have not found any credible evidence that compliance fees have affected consumer prices. This is a solid bill. The result of multi-year broad and robust stakeholder engagement process should be moved forward where we hope to continue to address outstanding issues and improve uh, with impacted stakeholders. Thank you so much for including us in today's hearing. Thank you, Mr. Dell Thomas. Um, now I'd like to call Mr. Martin over to the podium and ask Ms. Bailey to present herself. Good afternoon, Sir Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Kate Bailey and I'm here with the Association of Plastic Recyclers. We are the only North American association dedicated solely to increasing the recycling of plastics. So with that, I am here in support of this bill for one simple goal. We want to recycle more plastics, and this is the most proven effective policy to do so. I am here on behalf of the businesses that recycle your bottle, your plastic bottles, your milk jugs, your yogurt tubs every single day across the U.S. Recycling is a business. This bill is about investing in green jobs and a clean economy, and instead of throwing those materials into landfills, putting them back into the local economy, creating those green jobs and bringing more recycling businesses to the state and the region rather than expanding landfills. It will also build off the existing system. Minnesota has a recycling system in place. This is not up, upturning this, this is making it better and investing more in recycling instead of disposal. This type of producer funded program is well proven around the world. There are 20 to 30 years of experience with these programs in Canada and across Europe. Thousands of consumer goods companies are paying for their residents, residence recyclings in other countries. It's time to bring that to Minnesota. This is being rolled out in four states, implement, being implemented in four states right now, and the United Nations has even made this type of producer-funded recycling policy a global priority to reduce plastic pollution. So the case is well established, and this is a good bill. You've heard this has been years in the making. There has been great stakeholder feedback. It's a solid framework with a practical rollout over the next four years. Um, and the most important thing is to keep moving forward and put Minnesota on the path now. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. And uh, I'd like to call Ms. Uh, Kosuth to the, the table and ask that Mr. Martin, go ahead, go ahead uh, make your presentation. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Michael Martin, and I am the founder and CEO of Our World. That's Our Period World. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Morrison, members of the committee. I'm here to speak in support of the Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act, Senate File 3561. I'm here to tell you that reuse works today. My company, Minnesota-based Our World, is building the national infrastructure and movement for the reuse economy. We provide a turnkey solution where we provide logistics and washing to solve for reuse. We are operating in seven states and 44 cities in the United States and are starting to operate in Minnesota this year. The hottest topic in the waste space is reuse and it is being led out of Minnesota by our world. When we started the reuse movement back in 2017, we were the first reuse company in the country. There are now dozens of other companies operating all across the country and hundreds around the world. We all know the reduce, reuse, recycle saying well, it's an order of priority. We need to move towards reuse. Reuse is cost effective, it builds communities, creates jobs, and is better for the environment. My company, Our Wealth, has proven this all across the country. We've already stopped 47 tons of plastic from being produced and have washed and reused over 7 million items that without our reuse infrastructure would have gone to landfill. I want to be clear. The issue is not just about tackling single-use plastics, it's about tackling single-use anything. I used to be an investment banker, so I know what I'm talking about here on Wall Street. It makes no sense that businesses do not factor the disposal cost of their single-use packaging into their P&L. Instead, corporations externalize this cost and make taxpayers subsidize their profits by taxpayers paying for the disposal of the corporation's single-use packaging. This is wrong. EPR legislation that supports reuse starts to address this injustice. I ask you to support this bill because we all must be responsible for our own waste. With that, I would like to thank Senator Morrison, the chair, and members of the committee for allowing me to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Martin. 
for your testimony. Um, I'm going to call Mr. Stuber to, to the table and then ask Ms. Uh, Kosher to uh, testify and do, it to, do uh, state your name for the record. Thank you. My name is Mary Kasuth. Um, I'm here in support of uh, SF 3561. Um, I'm a 43-year resident of Minnesota, and for the last nine years, I've been studying an environmental contaminant called microplastics. Um, in the last decade, I've seen mounting evidence of this pollutant's pervasiveness. I've actually personally tested Minnesota lakes, rivers, springs, indoor and ambient air, as well as consumer products. And the only uh, constant throughout this is I never find nothing. As this discipline advances, new methods and techniques allow us to see things that we had missed originally, and gradually we're realizing that the problem is worse than previously thought. For example, a team of researchers at UMD once found only one to three particles per liter uh, of plastics in Lake Superior water, but now with more sophisticated technology, they're counting 600 to 1,500 particles per liter. Um, so essentially, the closer we look, the more we find. Um, I examined a few brands of bottled water in 2017 and found only four particles per liter, uh, but the smallest particles I could identify were relatively large, about the width of a human hair. Um, a year later, another bottled water study emerged and uh, the, was able to look at even tinier particles, and the average was 325 particles per liter. Just last month, an advanced analytical technique was again used in bottled water, and they found 240,000 particles uh, per liter. So, um, and 90% of those were in the nanoparticle range. So, and this size is concerning because microplastics have already been found in human lymph nodes, lung, blood, placenta, and breast milk. Um, so we can sit here and hope that the science is going to trend in another direction, or we can take protective action. Uh, there's a code of ethics in science where you can't conduct a randomized clinical trial on human subjects if there's evidence that giving or withholding treatment will cause harm. My question, not as a scientist, but as a parent, uh, does society at large have a code of ethics, or will we continue to uh, this non-consensual experiment and hope for the best? Minnesotans are aware of this issue. I've been teaching environmental science courses at Dunwoody College for 20 years, and on the first day, I always ask students to list their top environmental concerns. Plastic pollution never made these lists, but this fall, half of my students ranked it, and this spring, nearly 60% ranked it as a top concern. So these are not radical environmental activists. These are our future machinists, construction managers, and electricians working in industry. These Minnesotans are concerned about plastic waste. Uh, this is a systemic problem that cannot be solved by individual choices. I have read hundreds of microplastic papers, but I haven't seen one that shows that this contamination discriminates between political parties. So it affects everyone. I really hope we can work together and invest in a sustainable packaging infrastructure that prioritizes human health, environmental health, and bolsters local economies. Thank you for the time. Thank you, Ms. Kasuth. And I'd like to call uh, Mr. Tony Kilos to... Uh the table as well. Uh, before, now, I also ask for Mr. Uh, Stuber to testify. And for those who are redone testimony, if you're not pressed for time, uh, do stay on. And members are preparing the question to ask Sarah, Sarah Morrison. But in case you are here to be able to uh, support or, or you know, answer in an opposition, uh, you may be here. So. Um, Go ahead, uh, Mr. Stuber. Introduce yourself for the record. Hi, my name is Mr. Steve Stuber. Uh, thank you, Chair, Committee members, uh, Senator Morrison, for bringing this bill forward. I'd like to speak to the Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act. I was a county solid waste administrator for over 20 years. One of my jobs is to submit the annual score report to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. This report tracks all the waste and recycling collected throughout the county for the year. Recycling has improved, but has not changed significantly in my 20 years that I did that job. I feel we're not going to recycle our way out of this waste crisis. As mentioned earlier, um, this, there's a 75% re uh, required recycling rate for metro counties and 35% for greater Minnesota. But some small, smaller cities now in Minnesota have been cutting recycling services due to budgetary constraints, making reaching these goals much more difficult. The recycling rate for Minnesota is at 42 42.2%. 75% per, is going to be very hard to achieve if we keep producing these, all this packaging is not recyclable. Why regulate plastic? For one reason, a recent study by Consumer Reports 
found various chemicals such as phthalates in a number of popular food items, some which are made in Minnesota. Many of these chemicals called plasticizers are put in the plastic just to make the plastic more pliable. As consumers, we are ingesting these, these materials. I feel we must have a strong packaging reduction bill that reduces plastic production with specific target goals and consequences if they are not met. This bill must also ban false solutions like chemical recycling. We have to reduce the harm from plastic to our climate, our health, our economy, and our environment. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Stubert. Um, now I'll call, I'll call uh, Mr. Glazing to the table uh, where the empty seat is. And so go ahead. Now go ahead, uh, Mr. Tony Kulas. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you. My name is Tony Quillis. I'm the Director of Environmental Policy at the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, and I appreciate uh, the, you giving me the ability to make some comments on Senate File 3561. Unfortunately, they're going to be a little bit different than the previous testifiers um, that you've heard from. But Minnesota, I think we can all agree, is one of the leaders in national recycling efforts. We have a robust recycling infrastructure here and some of the highest recycling rates in the nation, depending on what stats and what reports you look at, ranging anywhere from 9th to 12th. But we're unique and different here in Minnesota because we have a solid waste tax that was started in 1997. That tax is paid by us as individuals at our households on our garbage bills at 9.75%. And for commercial and industrial facilities, it's 17%. And it raises, last I looked, a little bit over $100 million a year, about $102 million a year. This legislature has also invested heavily through its capital investment and bonding bills, millions of dollars to expand our local recycling and composting infrastructure. And that doesn't count private investments that companies have made in this state that also total in millions of dollars. So the structure is there, and it is obviously well-funded, Mr. Chairman. So I think we should pause before we go through and look at a new way to do it and possibly look at the existing structure right now. Another part of that is, is last year this legislature appointed $600,000 and required the Pollution Control Agency to come back and conduct a study on resource management. That overview was uh, supposed to look at the current system, come back and look at programs and policies to reduce waste by 90% by 2045, and look at the feasibility assumptions and costs of related to meeting those goals. That study is going to come back in July 15th of 2025. In regards to the bill itself, there's no exemptions in there at all, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, for products whose packaging are mandated by federal rule and law. So I just would like to point that out. I mean, in regards to our recycling and recycling infrastructure in the state of Minnesota, is there a conversation to be had of how we can make it better? I think there is, Mr. Chairman, and we'd love to be a part of that. But I just think that we should look at what the existing infrastructure is, get this report back that's due in July 15th of 2025, make a plan and move forward. Mr. Chairman and members, thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Kolas. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Cassidy to come forward forward, and Mr. Glassing, do, uh, in, do uh, introduce yourself for the record. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Peter Glessing, and I am the Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy for Medical Alley. Medical Alley represents a global network of more than 800 leading health technology and care companies in all corners of the state. Our mission is to activate and to amplify health care transformation. With access, affordability, and quality as top priorities, Medical Alley and our partners are committed to developing solutions which drive meaningful change and save lives. It is with these guiding principles that we express concern about Senate File 3561's <coughs> impact on access to care from medical devices, medical drugs, medical equipment, medical products, infant formula, medical food, and nutritional supplements. Medical device and drug manufacturers are ob obligated by the FDA to create packaging uh, according to certain specifications to maintain safety and functionality of life-saving medical devices and medical products used in thousands of routine and complex healthcare procedures every day. This is to ensure that the products are safe and effective for, for patients. Some medical devices are themselves packaging, such as blood bags, saline drip bags, 
and ostomy bags. Any additional state requirements risk compliance with the FDA. FDA approved products and equipment typically remain in service with the end user, patients, hospitals, or consumers until they reach the stage for disposal, at which point some hospitals operate recycling programs or participate in partnerships with manufacturers and other organizations to recycle or repurpose constituent materials. Many medical device manufacturers have specific sustainability goals and support recycling programs for their products and packaging. Some even operate stewardship and partnership programs to reclaim materials, including products and packaging, from consumers and hospitals to divert material from the waste stream and support the circular economy. We ask committee members to ensure this legislation prioritizes access to medical care while allowing for environmental stewardship to be carefully managed by federal regulators and industry to ensure consistent, a consistent process and stable supply of life-saving medical equipment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glassing. And for those who are online or remote, do stand ready uh, to present. And we'll begin with Mr. Start <coughs> as soon as uh, we hear from Mr. Cassidy. So Thank do you. state your name for the record. Yes. Uh, my name is Jacob Cassidy. I'm the Director of Government Relations with the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Um, the Association of Home Appliance Manufacturers, a trade association that represents over 160 companies. Our members manufacture major portable and floor care appliances, and we also represent the industry suppliers. Um, AHEM supports all material packaging, EPR, or Extended Producer Responsibility. We hope that this legislation will get to a point where it's something our members can vote to support. Right now, it's not there. We see it lacking um, a few, one significant aspects um, that's important to appliance manufacturers and a few others that we think can be worked on. And we look forward to, to joining the stakeholder process as a, as a packaging producer and a, and a producer of products that make consumers' lives much, much easier. So I just want to take a moment and as, as consumers, you likely know that when a major appliance is delivered to your home, uh, most often that packaging is taken back along with the old appliance. It was returned to the distribution center. The appliance is recycled. And so can, and some at most times, is the packaging that the new appliance came in. As a result, what we look for is that there is some sort of way to acknowledge that in the producer or the packaging definition. That is something that uh, the state of Oregon in their law has done, the state of California has done. It was nearly, didn't quite get to the finish line in Washington State uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, your neighbors to the north in Canada actually have what's what they call a blue box exemption. So that is one area that, that we'd like to see worked on. And I will we'll just tell this committee and this chamber um, that we are working with uh, folks in the, on the other side of the Capitol on that as well. Um, just kind of quickly, um, with respect to Oregon's law and other state laws, we do ask that you look, look to them predominantly, Oregon, and seek harmonization in the laws as much as possible. And um, one last thing is as, as advisory boards are defined and they're laid out, durable manufacturers have a place on those advisory boards just as much as any other packaging producer does as well. Thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to take any questions likely after the testimony is wrapped up. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cassidy. Now we're going to go to the first remote testifier. Um, the folks that were present here and testified that did stay in a, the approximate of two minutes in their presentation and hope that uh, those are on remote are, you know, prepared for the same. So, Ms. Yvonne Stark, um, Clean Water Action, do unmute yourself and state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair Her and members of the committee. I'm Ivana Stark, State Director of Clean Water Action Minnesota. I'm here on behalf of our over 132,000 Minnesota members, and our mission is to protect water quality for future generations. I'm grateful to Senator Morrison for bringing the Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act forward. Today, I'm speaking on the urgent need to find a solution for our waste problem. It fills our water with debris, overtakes communities across the globe as we export it, and the chemicals within it all leach out into our landfills and into our groundwater. 
which we in turn drink and it makes us sick. An average American produces about five pounds of waste per day or 1,800 pounds a year. Plastic waste is composed of roughly 13,000 different chemicals with 3,200 of those being listed by the EPA as chemicals of concern. Health impacts from chemicals in plastic include cardiovascular disease and stroke, infertility, cancer, thyroid problems, obesity, diabetes, and more. Plastic also breaks down into microplastics, as you've heard, and now they're being found in placenta, cord blood, breast milk, and even sperm. Humans are starting their lives exposed to microplastics and the toxic chemicals in them. More and more often, there are consumption warnings on fish because of microplastic contaminants. It is estimated that an average American consumes up to 5 grams of microplastic a week, and that's about the weight of a credit card. Producers have become skilled at transferring responsibility for pollution onto the consumer in an attempt to release themselves from the responsibility for what they create, market, and sell. To achieve a healthier, more sustainable future, we must all work together as producers and consumers. Manufacturers must take responsibility for the life cycle of their product through disposal. The current recycling structure isn't working because clearly we still have a waste problem and we don't have time to wait. This bill is a positive step forward towards a sustainable future with less waste and I urge your support and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Stark. Uh, next on our remote testifier, uh, Ms. Backhouse. Unmute. Great, thank you. I'm here. State your name for the record. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Amber Backus with United Strategies, and I'm here on behalf of the National Waste and Recycling Association's Minnesota chapter and the member companies that have generated over 17,000 jobs and provide collection, sorting, recycling, and disposal of waste in Minnesota. And as you've heard, Minnesota does have a great recycling story to tell. We're consistently in the top 10 for recycling with rates at greater than 45%, and that's thanks to private and public investment in recycling collection and recycling processing facilities. They do not want to put either the state's recycling rate or private sector and state-funded re recycling infrastructure at risk with the proposed legislation. Even with the state's high recycling rate, NWRA members continue to increase their investments and strive to do more. They're committed to working to reduce waste and reuse and recycle more materials, and there are things in the bill that will help drive end markets, like the language requiring post-consumer recycled content, which we support. But first and foremost, NWRA members want to build on the existing recycling collection and processing systems and hundreds of millions of dollars the state and their companies have made in infrastructure to support the system, not blow them up. The bill before you creates an entirely new bureaucracy that allows the brand manufacturers, as you've heard, the PROs, to run the businesses of NWRA members. Instead of haulers and processors competing to win the business of residents and a municipality or local governments themselves, as they currently do, the PRO will be setting collection territories and the fees they will pay them. Brand owners are empowered to oversee an industry that they are not specialized in. And based on the current legislation, the new brand owner run PRO organizations will set the rates for the work NWRA members do, reducing their margins and ability to increase investment in facility upgrades that allow more materials to be recycled. The, the new configuration will disrupt and in some cases eliminate existing contracts between NWRA members and their current customers. And lastly, it will reduce competition in the marketplace by creating service territories that force out small haulers. From the NWRA's perspective, the bill is giving way too much power to the PRO and disrupting relationships with customers that NWRA members have been building for years and in some instances, multiple generations. Before implementing a complete overhaul of the system, we suggest the state undertake a needs assessment and look at the waste system comprehensively to determine where there are gaps and make recommendations on where additional infrastructure is needed and what other material types could be recycled. And while the bill before you does contain a needs assessment, it's charged with figuring out the needs of an EPR system, not whether we need an EPR system in the first place. So again, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify. We have appreciated the ability to provide feedback to the bill's proponents, but the changes in the delete all don't do enough to protect a system that has made Minnesota a leader in recycling, and we'd ask the committee not to move forward with a bill that allows the brand owners to run it, and we look forward to continuing the dialogue with Senator Morrison. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Backhouse. Next is Mr. Heckman. 
Good evening, uh, Chair Herb, members of the Environment, Climate, and Legacy Committee. Um, my name is Andy Hackman. I'm here on behalf of AmeriPen, which is the American Institute for Packaging and the Environment. We represent the entire packaging supply chain from folks that make packaging components, paper, glass, metal, and all of the materials that are used in packaging. Brand owners like General Mills, Procter & Gamble, and Clorox that actually use packaging materials, and folks in the, the waste management sector that recycle packaging as well. Uh, you've got written copies of my testimony. The hour's late, so I'll keep it very brief. Um, we do continue to have some significant concerns with Senate File 3561 as amended, but we do want to speak to our appreciation for the engagement Senator Morris that the PRO structure is appropriate and the back and forth between the PRO and the Pollution Control Agency is a good balance between different stakeholders as, as well as the, the advisory council. Uh, we also appreciate and support, I think, the A8 amendment to the definition of producer that addresses some of our concerns that we noted on the House side on Tuesday uh, relative to defining some of the relationships between who has ultimate responsibility for packaging. In terms of our concerns, um, the recycling rates and dates that are in the legislation are not based on any real world uh, data that, that has come out of the state of Minnesota. As mentioned, um, there are four states that have passed EPR legislation. California is the only one that has rates and dates in the statute, and those are different than the ones that we're considering here uh, in this legislation. We do believe that the needs assessment should help set the potential rates and dates for recycling targets, and at a minimum, 5% adjustment to those rates and dates only at the commissioner's discretion is not enough uh, flexibility as we are really entering a, a space that nobody has, has entered yet and re reaching incredibly high recycling rates based upon still consumer behavior and participation in the system is a real challenge. We also remain concerned about the determination of what's considered recyclable and on a three-year rolling cycle for that determination, it's not flexible enough to allow materials to be considered recyclable. And then the, the approach to reusable packaging is incredibly uh, beneficial to reusable packaging, but does not anticipate some of the costs that are referenced in the system where they only pay one initial startup cost, but there are factors in the reimbursement section that would have producers paying for continual costs related to reusable packaging. So we appreciate the opportunity. We look forward to continuing to work with stakeholders on this legislation if it moves forward. And happy to answer any questions from the producer's perspective that reaches across the entire packaging industry. So thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Hackman. Next, Mr. Wilman. Unmute yourself and state your name for the record. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Fraser Wilman with the American Forest and Paper Association. In Minnesota, our industry employs over 23,000 with an annual payroll of over 1.7 billion. Estimated state and local taxes paid by our industry total $103 million annually. This production and the associated jobs, many of which are union, take place at member facilities across Minnesota, including St. Paul and in and around Minneapolis. EPR policies are typically applied as a solution for hazardous, hard to handle materials with low recycling rates. And this is not the case for paper. Our industry has a measurable record of success in making paper and paper-based packaging more circular and sustainable through market-based approaches. So we must respectfully oppose this bill at this time. Nationally, 68% of paper was recovered for recycling in 2022, maintaining or exceeding 63% since 2009. Recycling is integrated into our business. Our members operate over 100 material recovery facilities, including two in Minnesota, and 80% of mills use recycled fiber. 81.4% of Minnesotans have access to curbside recycling, and 73.3% have access to drop-off recycling, reflecting the successes of the state's ongoing investments in recycling infrastructure, including the $5.3 million grant in funding MPCA made available for continued recycling market development. The industry plans on continuing its investments with around $7 billion infrastructure investment by 2025 that will result in an over 9 million ton increase in capacity for recycled fiber. SF3561 would impede the vitality of our industry, limit access to products consumers rely on daily, and prescribe, broadly prescribes problems that do not reflect the reality of paper products. Fiber recovery is not only a tenant of our industry's commitment to sustainability, but is a key component of paper's value proposition. The bill is broad in its definition of paper product and does not consider the life cycle of specific products, such as unprinted paper, an intermediary unlikely to be found in municipal waste streams. 
From the perspective of the paper industry, this bill burdens a successful market-driven model where fiber is actively recovered to be put to its highest value use. EPR programs have not been fully implemented and are therefore untested in the U.S. context. Evidence shows there's not much, there, that such programs do not contain costs for consumers or increase paper recycling. I do appreciate the opportunity to testify before this committee and share our perspective, and I invite you to review our written testimony and ask that you please reach out if we can answer any questions or serve as a resource to you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Wellman. Next is uh, Ali Pack. State your name for the record. Hi, good afternoon, Senator Hansen and other members of the committee. Uh, my name is Ali Peck. Um, I represent the Consumer Technology Association. We are the leading trade association representing consumer electronic companies, uh, which support more than 18 million American jobs. Um, we are uh, testifying today in opposition to Senate Bill 3561, the Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act. Um, so while we support the overall intent of the bill to reduce packaging and waste in the state of Minnesota, we do not believe this bill, uh, as currently written, solves this problem. Um, our primary concern with this bill uh, is the statutory mandated performance goals, as outlined in Section 12, Subdivision 7. Um, we believe these statewide goals contradict earlier statements in the bill regarding the intent of the needs assessment. So it's our view that the needs assessment should serve as the baseline for the determination of the performance goals. Um, the reason that we are opposed to performance goals is because consumer technology products have unique protection needs to protect the products from breakage, um, which severely dictate and limit the packaging material types and amounts that um, these products can use. So, for instance, we do not want consumers to buy televisions only for them to then show up as broken because the source reduction targets, as outlined in this bill, made it so that the packaging couldn't adequately perform. Um, additionally, we disagree with the, the overall uh, mandated transition to refillable and removable packaging. Uh, while we agree that's an important component to increased resilience in uh, the U.S. recycling and solid waste management system, we just don't think that those requirements can be applied in the same manner to the electronics industry as they can to other traditional consumer packaged goods. Um, we disagree with the prohibition um, of toxic substances in the bill. Uh, we think it goes beyond the scope of reducing packaging waste, and uh, we think that any regulation of toxic, su toxic substances uh, should remain with the U.S. EPA in uh, their TSCA program. Um, so we, I have some written, written testimony, um, and which further details in more uh, our problems with the bill and and why we oppose uh, oppose it as written. Um, would love to further engage with the committee on um, how we can get to a place that could possibly be supportive um, of reducing packaging. Uh, in the state of Minnesota, but this just at the moment isn't is in a place where we can support it. So, uh, thank you, and I, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Ms. Peck. Next is Alex Shulove. Thank you, Mr. Member of the committee, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Alex Shulove, and I direct the policy work for the Biodegradable Products Institute, or MPI. Uh, we're North America's leading nonprofit organization representing certified compostable products. With over 500 member companies and over 20,000 products, you may have seen our logo on many of those products across the state. Um, we've also developed novel requirements to prohibit the use of PFAS and ecotoxins in our products through a certification program. While we support the intent behind EPR, uh, we're here to request a couple specific amendments that we provided in writing. Um, because of Minnesota's leadership, actually, in, in particular because of composting in the Twin Cities, we chose to host our first ever summit last year in Minneapolis. Uh, featured local municipal leaders and composters, so we have a close relationship with folks in Minnesota, and we know that in Minnesota and elsewhere that certified compostable products can help divert food scraps and other organic waste from landfills, um, whether that's households, restaurants, stadiums, you name it. And that reduces methane emissions and helps create a valuable soil amendment, and that role is, of course, complementary um, to reuse and recycling that other folks have spoken to. So with that said, we just want to make sure that this EPR bill doesn't exclude those benefits. Um, we want to ensure proper industry representation, support for compost collection and processing like recycling, and exemptions from post-consumer recycled content requirements because compostable products aren't designed to be recycled. Um, these uh, exemptions are 
I think, in just about every requirement um, for gross consumer recycle content across the state. So this is very much standard practice. Um, our asks overall, also, I should say, are not novel. They're based on principles that we developed with the U.S. Composting Council, representing the compost industry uh, and existing EPR laws that have been mentioned today in Colorado and California also include a lot of these amendments, uh, all of these amendments, I should say. So with the changes we're suggesting, we would support the bill. Um, you know, they're relatively specific and minor. So we thank you for your consideration, and uh, please feel free to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chula. And so this is con conclude of vision of our testimony or our, you know, our presentation from our testifiers. Next, we'll throw it back to our members to see if you have any questions to Senator Morrison or to any testifiers to clarify uh, your in inquiries. Members? Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I, um, I'll just start talking. I have statements, and if a question comes up, I'll ask that. Um, you know, I heard over and over again how this isn't going to impact people and the cost isn't going to go up. Well, anytime that someone's impacted that owns a business, they're going to pass that money on to their consumers. If I have a business and you increase my cost, I just pass that on to the consumer. So that's not realistic. Um, and so I'm concerned about that because that's, that is going to increase cost to maybe some people can afford it, but the, low, the people that aren't making a lot of money in Minnesota and all that's going to be an increased burden to them. So we have to be considerate of that. Um, we, we have many, we heard from many people here, you know, some people support the bill, some people oppose it. Um, and there's many, many reasons to be concerned. No, I think we should recycle. That's a good thing. And we should get towards not wasting materials. That's obvious. But, um, you know, just we have the Consumer Brands Association here. They say they oppose this. They have uh, the Consumer Brands Association represents the makers of American household brands. Uh, in the state of Minnesota, their industry contributes 4.5 billion GDP, 27.3 billion in labor, and supports 483,000 jobs. Uh, some of these product, products are Tide, Pampers, Gillette, Crest, Colgate, toothpaste, uh, many dish soaps, many personal care products, Kleenex, Huggies, toilet paper, Arm & Hammer products, OxyClean, bleach, Pine Sol, Glad trash bags, all Clor Clorox products, Kelvin Klein, CoverGirl, uh, Elf Beauty products, which has affordable makeup and skincare products, many different fragrance brands, Rubbermaid products, Sharpies, Crock-Pots, the list goes on. So all these products are going to increase in price. So we have to get, we get, we have to, get to a point where if we're going to do this, it's not going to come back on the consumer. So I hope we can work on the bill to get to a point where we can recycle. But this is also not just a Minnesota. These products don't come out of Minnesota. They come nationwide. So that's going to increase this price um, nationwide also. And I, I just I don't think we can put forward this bill as it is at this time. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wissenberg. Senator, Senator Green. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Green, for uh, I heard somebody say I, I, I yield my time back, so he yielded his time to me. So I know. That's, <laughs> <laughs> come on, Steve. <coughs> so if I understand, I, I missed it. I just want to reiterate from the very beginning, this bill, you're going to uh, move it from here to commerce, go through the commerce things, and then you're bringing it back here to put it into your omnibus bill. Is that is that, or is it going to be by itself, Senator? Uh, from my understanding of it, uh, will be by itself traveling, but I want to make sure that I'm correct on that. So if the council can uh, give you a run through. Mr. Chair, Senator Hoffman, yes, this bill has several more committee stops to make before it is done. Just to clarify then, Mr. Chair, thank you very much. Um, will it come back to this committee? Uh, people are shaking their head yes. Yes, they will come back to this committee, uh, Senator Hoffman. All right, I just yeah. so because, and I just wanted to say then, um, Senator uh, Morrison, uh, I signed on to this bill because of the fact I have a deep concern about on the medical industry, and I'm glad Medical Alley was here to talk about the things that that adjust that, and you know my history and in, in, in support of when you're talking about AFOs, you're talking about carbon fiber, you're talking these things that are important. The FDA really pushes on the requirements, right? And so I appreciate uh, your willingness to, to work hand in hand um, uh, with the folks that, that I have a, a deep concern about making sure that we're not leaving anybody left behind, right? Granted, 
Minnesota's doing their thing. But those things, and I'm glad that they were here to point that out. And then also I, I sent you a note just on my local waste haulers, just a couple of points, and I appreciate the fact that you're willing to work with them too. And it seems to me that there could be a simple, simple kind of clarification points on that. But I just want to make sure that when we're looking at you know, the, the whole medical device industry, the, the large amount of it, you know, and I'll tell you, one in four people in the state of Minnesota live with some kind of disability, so, right? And that's, it's actually one in five, but one in 10 are chronic, therefore you can say one in four, it's 25%. When you look at our, our issues with the um, hospitals, it's due to the fact that there's an intersectionality of things happening. It's a systemic issue. When we start to see something like this, we wanna make sure that that we're not leaving those folks behind that, that need to be uh, addressed, right? Yet at the same time, find that balance of protecting. You know, what are the, what are the other alternatives that are out there, right, you know, for regarding that? And I think the FDA, hand, you know, going working side by side in that makes it, that's why it's gonna be important for me that this bill reflects that we're including all people, right, Senator? And not just a certain segment of persons that are pushing for a certain bill, right? I want to make sure that we're including all people in that conversation and that it's a systemic look, not necessarily. And I appreciate uh, the lead of uh, Senator Morrison on this, and I look forward to it coming back here. Um, and I look forward to the fact that your staff and Senator Morrison's staff are going to be working with some folks in Mental Alley and some of our garbage haulers. So thank you for that. Thank you, Sam Hoffman and Sam Morrison. You, any any uh, remarks on that? Um, I always, always appreciate Senator Hoffman being uh, very mindful of being one of the most inclusive members of our Senate members. So, Senator Morrison. Mr. Chair and Senator Hoffman, I, I agree. I appreciate Senator Hoffman's inclusivity too. Um, and certainly if there are exceptions that need to be made around medical device, of course we will consider that. Probably not in the context of this committee as we've talked about. Um, but I would point out too, and I and I agree with Senator Wiesenberg as well. We need to part of the beauty of this plan, I think, is that it takes the burden off of individual taxpayers and cities and counties. We have a garbage problem; we just do, and we're not going to recycle. We're not going to burn and landfill our way out of it. And we've demonstrated that that is making our climate crisis worse. We're losing land, uh, and it's harming our water and ultimately our health, as evidenced by. Um, the testimony about microplastics, for example. Um, so I appreciate the comments and um, we'll continue to work with all the various stakeholders. Thank you. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I do have a couple of questions and, and I thank you for, for your commitment to bring this back because some of my questions have to do with the fiscal note and I think I will hold off on some of those which would maybe get us out of here by six. Uh, otherwise, I don't know if we'd make it. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll take your time. Uh, so uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, to the bill author, um, you're going to be making, or they're going to be putting together an 18-member board uh, on, on this bill, unless that's been changed by the, the lead all, because I went through the main bill. Uh, so I added up the numbers. You had an 18-member bill, which is going to be probably, our uh, commission, which is going to be pretty costly. But I assume now that the enforcement of this is going to be done through the MPCA. Senator Morrison and our member of MPCA. Uh, Representative from MPCA. That's Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Green, yes. MPCA is um, the administrating agency. Mr. Mr. Chair, thank Senator you. Green. Thank you for that, uh, Senator Morrison. And then has the, did you talk to the MPCA and have they told you how many new FTEs they might need for this? Senator Morrison. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Green, I do not have an answer to that yet. Okay. Senator Green. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that, was, that would be a pretty, uh, pretty big thing to know. We've already added uh, like a 40% increase in government last year. It looks like we're heading down the same, uh, same uh, road here. Um, trying to, I'm trying to go through my questions. I had them down, and I want to eliminate the ones that have to do with... Uh, um, the funding. But I will say this, though, uh, uh, this was on there too, and uh, Senator Wiesenberg mentioned it about the cost to the people. I've heard numerous times here that there'll be no cost to taxpayers with this. And 
the first thing I would have to say is I, I can't hardly believe you're going to see the counties come in and reduce the number of uh, dollars they're going to be bringing in. So I don't think that's going to change too much. But then as these things are implemented, this is going to be a, 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 a substantial cost to the people that are packaging these uh, products, sending them out. And that cost will increase the, or th that will, will increase the cost of these products. And so anybody that uses them is going to be paying that. And so not only will it not uh, reduce the price to taxpayers, you probably are going to see the biggest impact again on the people who can afford it the least. And we see this with the other packaging bills that came through. The, the cost that's going to increase to diapers, for instance, formula, uh, all these things that impact, impact our families. And I, I wonder sometimes how well thought out these bills are before they come forward. Uh, they just seem to have an idea that you have this utopian view that you want to grab onto without considering all the consequences or even if it's, even if it's possible. Uh, I also don't like the fact that we are uh, moving forward with this when we're already waiting for uh, a study that we had commissioned that's coming forth uh, in a little over a year to, to find out where we should be going on a lot of these issues. And here we are, and this happened before, and, and you know, you talk about recycling, this whole subject has been recycled many times, almost at nauseum. I've got, uh, I can tell you when our garbage haulers made huge uh, investments into their businesses for sorting, and then the state came by and pulled the rug out from underneath them, and they were left hanging, uh, hanging there. There's also recycling plants that, uh, I don't know the, the individual recycling plants and what their reasons are, but some of them are struggling and some are even closing down. And I assume a lot of that has to do with the regulations coming from the state. And we just need to look at, at what's going on now and whether or not it's really working. Uh, I've heard uh, people talk about 40% is, is a dismal amount of recycling and other people say 45, 40 to 45% is great because you can't make people recycle. Um, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, um, there is a lot of issues on the fiscal side of this uh, that we're going to have that we're going to have to hash out. And besides that, I hope that we get a study on on the fiscal note to the people. Uh, what is it going to cost the manufacturers? Uh, how much are they going to have to raise their costs? Because our fiscal notes come in, and they'll tell us what it's going to cost the state, but it doesn't tell tell us what the impact is to the real people out there that we're supposed to be representing. So I'll look forward to those uh, conversations when the bill comes back. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Senator Green. And um, I, that's, before, we, before we started this committee, I did encourage you to ask for you know, a question on finance, and thank you for um, putting that question forth. But uh, Sen Senator House Chow. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Senator Morrison, for bringing this forward. Um, I think about the three words, reduce, reuse, recycle, because they're etched in my brain as a school kid. Um, and I'm really proud of what we've done in Minnesota on recycling. And I do think that this idea is important. Um, but of course, much like literally every other policy, I'm in the middle on this, and I'm trying to figure out what to do, right? And, uh, and I like a lot of it, and I'm, and I'm challenged by parts of it. Um, you know, in my district and in Senator Eichhorn's district and Senator Rarick's district, we have a, a big paper industry, uh, timber industry, um, and I've visited those those paper mills. I've I've stand on the striking lines with the Teamsters, um, and and that's an important industry in Minnesota and and to the northern Minnesota economy. And so, in my mind, everything I have learned from that industry in my time in office, which has been short, uh, is that they are doing things right. Um, when you think about even before we moved into the modern era of recycling, paper was always the thing that we were recycling. I mean, it, it, it almost became natural that you would be recycling paper. And, and the stats, uh, you know, I don't want to run through it. We already heard the testimony, but, but paper is enormously well recycled. It's an industry that's been investing in how to do this right. Um, and so, you know, I've talked to a couple of the advocates, I've talked to the industry um, and others about how can we make this bill work for paper? Because I think they are different in, in a lot of regards. And I just want to make sure that whatever we're doing, 
that we're not limiting one of the greatest industries we have here in, in northern Minnesota, in, in Minnesota in general. Um, so I, I don't have an answer yet. It's been a short time since I've seen the bill, but just know that, that I am working with folks sort of all across uh, this area to figure out what might be possible for, for when a bill comes, comes back. Um, I would just make clear that uh, I'm not at a place to support this uh, without figuring out what I can do to improve it for, for that industry. So um, I look forward to it coming back to this committee and I'll keep working on it and I'll have further conversations with you, Senator Morrison. Thank you, Senator House uh, Senator Eichhorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and also thank you for committing to bring this bill back before this committee. That's going to greatly shorten up my questions for the day. I do still have uh, just a couple. I am concerned about the kind of powers we're going to be handing over to the commissioner. Can you detail what kind of powers exactly we're going to be handing, handing over to the departments? Um, I get nervous about that regardless of what the policy is just because that takes it out of the hands of the legislature where most of the policy decisions should be made, not the agencies. So can you detail that a little more, either that or if you want to have one of the agencies come up, I'm fine with that as well. Mr. Chair and Senator Eichhorn, I can Sorry. read that part of the bill, but it might be more useful to have someone from um, PCA come up to talk about that. Uh, yes, Mr. Kadoka, Kadoka, to uh, come forth. Thank you, Chair and committee members, and thank you for the questions. The agency's main role will be looking and reviewing the plan that's put together, the product stewardship plan, and approving it by comparing it to what's in statute. And it's something that we've been working with the advocates and the authors on, is making sure there's clarity there from the legislature on how we're supposed to judge whether or not a plan is approved or denied. And so that's where that um, specificity and it's one of the largest parts of the bill is what needs to be in the plan and for how for us to judge it whether or not it meets the criteria. That's also where the statewide requirements are very helpful is because we know we can be able to tell whether or not it's meeting the quality standards that the legislature has set for us and, and not have it be um, just something else where it's checking to see if a certain type of paragraph is in, in the report or not, making sure we have that direction from the legislature by the plan. Any follow-ups? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I'll have a couple. So one, one concern I have is, is typically we've seen in other industries that it's not always easy for people to follow along with what the PCA wants. And, and I, we've seen in several instances where the ball sometimes moves with state agencies. Um, not always yours, but sometimes yours. And I'm concerned about the $100,000 per day potential violation, even if somebody is making an attempt. So that is definitely a worry for me as well. The other thing I'd have next on a question, then I'll just make a few statements and be done. Um, I know the fiscal note's not here yet, but you must have some idea of kind of what this might cost. Do you have a 10,000 foot overview of, of what it might cost to get the pro program started up? Mr. Kudeka. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, the cost for standing up the pro and everything would be assessed by the producers on themselves and cover their own costs. The agency costs will be the staff that's needed to oversee the reporting and the approval of the plans and the needs assessments. So it's going to be along those quantities. We're finishing up the fiscal note right now. Uh, it hasn't uh, finished, but those costs, the way the system is built, the same way it's built for paint products stewardship, which the legislature has passed, is those costs would be directly covered by the pro, the producer responsibility organization. So there would be no, it would be a net zero to the agency and to the state government based on the way the bill is designed. Ba Mr. Chair, Senator based on the, the previous experience with the paint program, what did that cost the manufacturers? I, I know about what it would cost the agency and I am concerned about the agency expense. That's what we're really looking at here as legislators and our responsibility, but what is it gonna cost these entities, because ultimately those those dollars are probably going to be passed on to the end consumer. So, do we have an idea like what that overarching cost would be, Mr. Kudeka? Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, uh, Paint is a very narrow product stewardship organization in in uh, span, so it will be more more FTEs staffing than what's in there. So, I don't have a, a good comparison at this point. We'll be able to document that in the, the fiscal note. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll look forward for that in the fiscal note. Uh, and I do appreciate uh, Senator Housechild's concern about the uh, forest products industry. That was my concern as well. Uh, I don't 
think it makes a lot of sense to include some of those paper products. As Senator Hostrad alluded to, uh, and in, in the, the letter the American Forest and Paper Association sent to us, uh, a quote from theirs, our industry's recycling rates are already so successful that some of the products are approaching the maximum achievable recycling rate. And that's something we should be proud of. Um, so it doesn't necessarily make sense to add them to part of this stream because it could create some upheaval for a program that's already working to try to prop up less effective streams. And our paper industries are one that can least afford the extra cost at this point. If you're looking at globally how the paper industry is, I mean, they're already stretched extremely thin doing operations in Minnesota. We're one of the most, we used to be one of the best places in the world to operate paper making, and now we're one of the most expensive places in the world to operate paper making. And that causes a lot of concern for the mills in my district, Senator Rarick's district, Senator Housechild's district, because I don't want this, e even though it may seem insignificant to some people, to be the final nail in the coffin of any one of those facilities as they're making decisions globally. One little thing like this or increased energy costs might tip the scale for either hundreds or thousands of jobs in northern Minnesota. So that is of great concern to me. On the other front, uh, Senator Wiesenberg alluded, uh, alluded to it and was absolutely correct. To, to put it correctly, producer funded doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna, the, the producer's gonna write the check, but ultimately producer funded means consumer funded. There was actually a study uh, out of uh, university in New York that looked at just on the grocery front what people will pay in additional costs at the grocery store between $36 and $57 a month increase uh, based on their EPR modeling study that one of their universities did. Uh, and I think, quite frankly, we've squeezed consumers, Minnesotans, enough already. $36 to $57 a month um, is real money. Uh, so that's great concern for me as well. The other comment that was made in here on the consumer front, and I'm really concerned that these are going to be passed on to the consumer. There's no way they won't be. Consumer purchasing, and this was alluded to in the study here, consumer purchasing power has declined by the most in a generation. As a result, any actions that could further exacerbate inflationary pressures must be approached with extreme caution as households are already in an economically perilous situation as a result. So I think we need to use that extreme caution as well for our consumers, for our industries. And I hope that you're able to talk with uh, forest products industries, paper industry as we go forward. I, I don't think the inclusion of that makes sense right now. I hope there can be some consensus there just because there is, that, that's my biggest hang up right now is that forest products industry. And I, I hope between now and when it comes back here, you're able to have some conversations with those industries so we can at least let them know uh, that they're not going to be harmed by this. So I'm, I'm hoping those discussions can continue, and I'll look forward to uh, additional discussion as this comes back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sarah Icorn. Uh, Senator McCune, you, you have a review. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will also try to be short. I know that it's been a long afternoon for everybody. Um, you know, I, I have to say that sometimes uh, I've been now doing this work for three years, and sometimes being a member of the Senate, I'll sit in a committee like this, and I listen to uh, my colleagues, and I feel so uh, disconnected um, from what my colleagues are expressing that it sometimes makes me wonder, what in the heck is going on? Um, you know, I, I, uh, I wonder where this bill has been my whole life. I was born in 1977. And um, I came up in northern Minnesota in Duluth. I was raised and um, feeling as if and being taught in school that saving the planet is an individual responsibility, that if you just recycle harder and if you just um, you know, are a better friend of the earth that you, you yourself bear that responsibility and that you, you, you should take that on and you should do that. And that's nonsense. These are systems problems. They have always been systems problems. 
Where has corporate America been, like, all my life on this? What kind of responsibility have you been taking for your products and what happens to them? We've heard some great testimony from my colleagues about certain industries that have done a better job than others and they've taken, taken that responsibility seriously and they're trying to do, do right by us. And I appreciate those efforts, I really do. But when I hear that Lake Superior has these microplastics in it, my lake up in Duluth, that is a spiritually significant culturally significant lake for me, certainly, and I know for all of the people in my community when we look out on that lake every day. Corporate America has filled that lake with microplastics that are now like in my body right now and in my kids' bodies who are up in Duluth right now. <laughs> like, the idea that we wouldn't do this now, we are way late to the game, friends. I mean, way late to the game. So when I hear things like, we're, we're, we have this utopian view, we're gonna create this utopia. I'll tell you what's a utopia. This very Pollyannish, naive view that we can just say, you know, we'll just throw it away, throw it in a landfill, just keep throwing it away. We don't want it anymore, throw it away. Throw away communities, throw away woods, throw away water, throw away all the things we don't want anymore so we don't have to look at them. We can't do that anymore. We know that that's never really been true. And now we are having to deal with those decades of terrible decision making and a lack of responsibility and a lack of foresight on the part of our business community, on the part of our legislator, legislature and our leaders. Um, I agree that uh, with some of the things that my colleagues said that we have, you know, that producer funded means consumer funded. Unfortunately, I think that's correct. Um, but it's, it's, really, it's really something of an admission, isn't it? We have, I know, I, when we talk about the industries that have been mentioned today, I'd like to take a look, and if I put together a list of how much profit some of those corporations are bringing home and how much money some of those CEOs and executives are bringing home, offloading the costs onto taxpayers, offloading the costs onto our counties, offloading the costs onto my health and my kids' health and my community's health. When they pass on the costs to us, we got to start asking some serious questions about what the heck is going on. Because they shouldn't be, but we know they do. We know just in this last period where we've um, undergone a pandemic and we've seen inflation rise, real inflation, we've also seen what looks like inflation but is actually is what many people have termed greedflation where corporate actors have taken advantage of this situation and raised prices artificially. So it's quite an admission to say, you know, instead of actually incurring those costs as they should, they're gonna pass those on to consumers because they're worried about their profits and they're gonna make sure they keep making that buck at the end of the day. Um, so I'd like to do something about that if we can. I, um, Senator Morrison, thank you very much for authoring this bill, and thank you very much to all the coalition partners who've been working on this, and thank you also to the business interests who've acted sincerely as good partners in this work to try to make this workable and try to get your memberships of your organizations on board with this. I am sincere, sincerely grateful to all of you for participating in the process. Um, I would argue that the recycling rate that we have here in Minnesota, while it may be one of the best, Maybe not something to brag about, right? I mean, if we're comparing ourselves to maybe some other states in the union, sure. Um, but 40-some percent, are you kidding me? Stuck there? So there's so many reasons to do this. I could go on and on. I won't belabor the point. But thank you for bringing the bill. I support it wholeheartedly. I will be watching it from the point of view of making sure that we're not weakening it, weakening it to the point where um, it becomes ridiculous, right? 
I understand that perhaps there's some changes that need to be made in certain areas, and and I I uh, accept that. Um, but thank you. I support the bill wholeheartedly. Sarah Morrison, any Mr. Chair, month? can I ask one more quick one? It might so, be for sorry. staff. Okay. Um, and Senator Lang mentioned this to me uh, on a text here. He's listening online still, and I and I think it would probably be helpful. Um, is there going to be a local impact statement, do you know, in the fiscal note when we get that? If not, if that's something we can include, I think a local impact statement would be helpful for us as well. Okay, I think uh, council can answer that. Mr. Chair, I actually can't answer that. I'm not entirely sure whether or not that'd be included in the fiscal note for this uh, bill, but I can certainly relay that on to the fiscal analysts. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah Morrison. Mr. Chair and members, thank you for the conversation. I want to uh, thank all of the coalition members who have worked literally for years to help craft this bill. Um, I'd like to leave uh, Senator McEwen with the final word because her passion was uh, wonderful and appropriate. We can't continue to do what we're doing now. We need to, we need to change course. Our waste stream is increasing. We're creating more landfills. We're burning more trash. We need to do something different. So I, I hope to earn the support of everyone in this committee today and when we return. Um, but we'll keep working on it and keep engaging with um, all of the stakeholders. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for a very engaging discussion on this bill, uh, Senate File 3561. So I will motion that we move the Senate File 3561 as amended to be recommended to pass and be referred to the Senate Commerce Committee. So all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay, motion prevail. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, the testifier as well and member of the audience uh, and staff, uh, council and everyone, and we're close to spot on on our time and so, uh, announcement uh, for the upcoming hearing on February 26th, uh, Committee Administrator uh, Josephson. Thank you, Akar Josephson, Committee Administrator. Quick announcement, we're going to be having a joint hearing this coming Monday, February 26th at 9 a.m. with the Senate Ag Committee to hear a presentation on nitrates in the karst region by the um, affected agencies. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, all, and the um, committee is adjourned.